Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. Tes satu dua tiga tes. JR Pak. Oke. Okay. Simut sih. Oke, okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang. The Honorable Vice Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Engineering Universitas Negeri Padang. The Honorable Our Keynote Speaker. Profesor Dr. Satar from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Asisten Profesor Dr. Vimal Kumar from Chaoyang University of Technology, Taiwan. Dr. Insinyur Kinanti Wijaya, MSc from Universitas Negeri Medan. Dr. Reno Renaldi, MKS from Universitas Hang Tuah. And Dr. Fahmi Rizal, MPDMT from Universitas Negeri Padang. The Honorable Vice Dean, Head of Department, Secretary of Department, our presenter, lecturer, student, and all the participants of the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ninth International Conference of Technical Vocational Education and Training, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang, November 19th. 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the conference, let's sing Indonesian National Anthem, Indonesia Raya. Please be ready for this National Anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Next is her reciting Quran and will be recited by Yosi Novita Sari. Free memory. Next is welcoming speech by our chairman of the conference. Please welcome Professor Dr. Ambiar MPD. Free memory. Ladies and gentlemen, Next is welcoming speech by Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang. 
and today will present by our vice dean. Please welcome Dr. Waskito MT. Free memory. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's give our full attention to to the opening speech from the rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, represented by our vice rector. Please welcome to the Honorable Dr. Refnaldi Emlit. Rememori. Announcement for all the participant and uh, presenter. Please rename your Zoom name with our guide. It's uh, for the presenter. Uh, room name underscore your name underscore presenter. And for the participant, it's your name underscore participant. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
Tidak bisa harus Tidak masuk Ini Tapi sudah masuk Tidak masuk Terus ibu dengar ini nanti gimana ya Iya atau pakai head, head bawa headset sih ibu headset bawa sih ada tapi yang headset biasa apa ini kegedean pak halo pak oh gitu karena bapak jenat tv bapak mama Tes satu dua tiga tes tes satu dua tiga. Tes satu dua tiga tes. Thank 
Sabe? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh The Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, the Honorable Vice Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, the Honorable Dean of Faculty of Engineering of Universitas Negeri Padang, the Honorable our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Sata from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Assistant Professor Dr. Vimal Kumar from Chaoyang University of Technology Taiwan. Dr. Insinyur Kinanti Wijaya MSc from Universitas Negeri Bedan, Dr. Reno Renaldi MKS from Universitas Hang Tuah, and Dr. Fahmi Rizal MPD MP from Universitas Negeri Padang. The Honorable Vice Deans, Head of Department, Secretary of Department, our presenter, lecturer, student, and all the participants of the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the 9th International Conference of Technical Vocational Education and Training, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang, November 19th, 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the conference, let's sing Indonesian National Anthem, Indonesia Raya. Please be ready for this National Anthem.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Next is a reciting Quran and will be recited by Yosi Novita Sari. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. وَإِذَا قِيلَ
Next is welcoming speech by our chairman of the conference. Please welcome Professor Dr. Ambiar MPD. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Peace be upon us all. My respect for Rector Universitas Negeri Padang, Prof. Kanefri PhD, keynote speaker Prof. Dr. Satar, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Dr. Fahmi Rizal, MPD-MT, Universitas Negeri Padang, Prof. Associate Professor Kirnal Toman, Sayon, University of Technology Taiwan and invite speaker Dr. Insinyur Kinanti MSK Universitas Negeri Medan and Dr. Renaldi SKM MKS Pangtua University Pekanbaru. What I respect is also the audience who cannot be mentioned one by one. On this happy Today, let me welcome the participants of the International Conference on Technical and Vocational Education and Training, ICTPET, which is currently implemented by the Postgraduate Program, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang. As a conference activity in the field of TPET, the term is Technology, Science and Vocational Education Training, with consists of several topics, namely instructional model and media, vocational teacher science education, applied engineering, hospitality and tourism, curriculum and TFET, vocational assessment in TFET, and management vocational education training. The purpose of this conference is to improve vocational education training. and scientific development in the field of TPET and to disseminate various findings with the swap TPET of various related parties and interested people. At this conference, 100 articles from UNP, Bumi Persada University, Loks Mawe, UP, Bandung, Universitas Negeri Jakarta, Jakarta, Universitas Negeri Udayana, Ibnu Sina, Medan, etc. Article have been registered that will be presented participant offering various topics in affair. In the end, participant article will be categorized on article published in various journal in index purpose, international proceeding Atlantic press, and national journal index Sinta. Meanwhile, the participant who will attend both the online and online are estimated to around 400 participants. Thus, I convey you this welcome one again then due to the various parties who have helped to set so that this activity can carry it on and especially to the committee who has worked hard to prepare everything. And as the head of the first credit program at the Faculty of Engineering, I apologize is there if they are in anything this place regarding the implementation of this activity. Thank you again. And the LIN, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, next is a welcoming speech by Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang. And today we'll present by our Vice Dean, Please welcome Dr. Waskito MT. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, Profesor Ganevri PhD, Vice Rector for Academic Affairs, Dr. Refnaldi M. Lid, Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Dr. Fahmi Rizal, MPDMT, Coordinator of Postgraduate Study Program in TFED, Professor Dr. Ambiar, MPD, 
Excellencies keynote speakers, Professor Dr. Satar from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Assistant Professor Dr. Fumal Kumar from Chaoyang University of Technology, Taiwan, Dr. Fahmi Rizal, MPDMT from Universitas Negeri Padang, Indonesia, Dear Invite Speaker, Dr. Insinyur Kinanti Wijaya, MSC from Universitas Negeri Medan, Indonesia, Dr. Reno Rinaldi, MKS from Universitas Hang Tuah, Pekanbaru. Dear speakers, that I heard earlier were 100 paper will be present from several universities, from national and international. Excellencies, the participants, and which I am proud of, the committee that has held this conference. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On this lovely morning, I invite all of us to always be grateful to God because of his blessing. We can attend this conference and meet each other today. I want to thanks to the participant from the keynote speaker, speaker and uh, for the committee that I know she have been work hard to delivery and to do uh, the conference. I think uh, this conference will be support to the dream of the Universitas Negeri Padang to become, uh, will be world-class university. We hope the all of the article that presented in this conference will be published in the uh, Scopus Index Journal. Request uh, by Vice Rector to the uh, speech and opening this seminar uh, or conference international. That's uh, all for me. Uh, thank you, and uh, see you again in uh, the other conference. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's give our full attention to the opening speech from the Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang, represented by our Vice Rector. Please welcome the Honorable Dr. Refnaldi Emlit. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Salatu wassalamu ala srafil anbiya al-musalim. Wa ala alihi wa sabihi rasulillah jima'in nama ba'du. The Honorable Deans of Faculties of Engineering, Deans of other faculties, Vice Deans, Head of Departments, Program Coordinators for the Graduate Program in the Faculties of Engineering, Invited Speakers and all participants of the NINS International Conference on Technical Vocational Education and Training, ICTVAT, organized by the Graduate Program of Faculties of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang. So I'm very happy to stay in this room and virtual room that this is one of the great 2022 International Conference Series in Universitas Negeri Padang, which has received great support from many partners. So representing rectors of Universitas Negeri Padang, I am very pleased to join the opening of this hybrid conference. I wish to convey my sincere appreciation to the Dean of Faculties of Engineering, who has regularly provided great support for making this conference event happen yearly. Also thanks to the distinguished speakers, moderators, for taking time to participate from near and far in today's conference. I believe this conference will become a good medium and opportunity for us to communicate and share newest information about knowledge, concept, theories, and result of the research 
And the most important things is to create networking, to cooperate, collaborate with other participants as well as institutions in national and international level. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Health Organization officially classified COVID-19 as a pandemic in early March 2020. So extraordinary safety measures, health restriction, and social isolation were in place. So education is experiencing significant changes. Its foundations are being challenged as schools and universities worldwide are forced to choose to prevent the spread of the virus. So I think at this conference, various causes, reasons, solutions related to sustainable education, especially for the vocational education, were carried out to achieve social justice and the sustainable development goals. And I hope there will be scientific discussion that will result in solution to the problem that we can achieve, especially for the vocational education. So distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, representing the academic staff, administrative staff, students of Nivstan Sri Padang, would like to thank our invited speakers, especially Professor Dr. Satar from University of Bangsa, Malaysia, Assistant Professor Dr. Fimal Kumar from Chaoyang University of Technology, Thailand, Dr. Fami Rizal from Nivstan Sri Padang, and other invited speakers that cannot be mentioned one by one, all parallel speakers. And of course, participants for your contribution, which will make this conference a success. We expect we learn new ideas from each other, which we can adopt and adapt to further improve our work in vocational education. And members of organizing committee have been working very hard I'd like to thank them for their dedication, time, and effort. I wish also to thank our partners, individual and organization, partners as well as volunteers. Without their generosity, we would not be able to create a total environment to support your full participation. Thank you all for your presence and participation, and you are the very important part of the conference success. Please enjoy the conference. So ladies and gentlemen, in the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the God Almighty, and by expecting his mercy, by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, the NAINS International Conference of Technical Vocational Education and Training is officially open. Thank you. Wabilahi taufiq al-hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much to Dr. Rafnaldi for welcoming our keynote speaker, presenter, participant and for opening our conference officially. Next is photo session. For all of us, please be ready for this session. Open your camera and I'll wait for a minute until you'll be ready. For all participant and presenter, please be ready for this session. Open your camera. Okay, I'll count by three, two, one, and hold your position. Okay, three, two, one, and hold your position until our operator capture the photo. Okay, hold. Hold. Okay, finish. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, the opening ceremony of the ninth International Conference of Technical Vocational Education and Training is finished. After this, we have three sessions to be held. But before that, I would to like to. Uh, remind you to fill the attendance list throughout the link, the link that we serve in that column and chat column. The link will have uh, will 
uh, we share uh, until uh, keynote speaker session start. All right, let's continue. Uh, the first session is right after this. We will have our keynote speaker session up to 12 o'clock. Then we will have lunch break for one a half hours. At 1.30 p.m. we will start our parallel session. And the last session is closing ceremony at 4 p.m. where we will also announce the best presenter of the conference. We do hope that all our participants will stay with us until we close our conference officially. Now for the keynote speaker session, Zebra for keynote speaker for today's conference. And the session will be led by our moderator, Ms. Risma Abdeni MT and Dr. Rizky M. Ayulansari. Before I hand this session to Ms. Risma Abdeni MT, I would like to thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you. All right, so Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ninth International Conference on Technical and Vocational Education and Training held by the Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang. It is a great pleasure for me to be here again, to be the moderator of uh, the keynote speaker session. Uh, my name is Risma Abdeni. I'm a lecturer at uh, Civil Engineering Department of uh, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Negeri Padang. For the keynote speaker session, we will have three keynote speakers during this conference. And later on, we will also have two invited speakers. At the end of each presentation of the speakers, we will have a question and answer session. So during the speech, all the participants can post their question on chat and the committee will choose two or three questions to be answered by uh, the speaker. All right, so according to our schedule, our first keynote speaker is Professor Dr. Muhammad Satar Rasul. Let me check first whether he already joined us. Professor Satar, are you with us? Yes, yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Professor, thank you. All right, uh, welcome to the ninth ITT VEC. Professor Muhammad Satar, uh, good morning, and how are you? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> how yeah, are you? Uh, may I, I'm good too, thank you. So yeah. may I know uh, in what city are you today joining us? Pardon? In? In what city? Oh, actually I'm in Pahang City. Pahang. Uh, Pahang, Pahang, because we have an election today. Um, oh. So I have, I have to go back to my hometown in Pahang. Oh, Actually, I'm staying in, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I hope that the election will run smoothly. Yeah. So, um, Professor Satan, before you deliver your presentation, allow me to introduce you to our audience first. So, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Satan, Muhammad Satan Rasul, is a professor in technical and vocational and STEM education, STEM stands for uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. He's also a chairman of STEM and Culturation Center in University Kebangsaan Malaysia, and he obtained a master's degree and doctor of philosophy degree in industrial engineering and system from University Putra Malaysia. His research area include TVET curriculum, TVET career development, and STEM education. In 2018, he received an award of oh, the most highest researcher receiving eternal research grant. 
and uh, he has received a number of grants from NGOs and industry, such as FEDA and Exxon Mobil, Exxon Mobil or Exxon Mobil? Mobil. Exxon Mobil, two years in a row from 2015. And he received Malaysian Research Assessment Outstanding Award in 2019. Until now, he has been, he has published 193 articles in index journal and 14 academic books. Impressive, Professor. <laughs> and has been as keynote speaker at more than 35 national and international conference or seminar. At the national level, he has been appointed as Technical Advisory Council member for TVET Teaching and Management by the Center for Instructor Training and Advanced Skill, Department of Skill Development, Ministry of Human Resources, Malaysia. And at the internal, international level, he has been appointed uh, as consultant in several organizations, including local consultant for Malaysia by the Department of Skill and Development, uh, Ministry of Human Resources, Malaysia. Uh, okay, impressive, <laughs> CV, <laughs> Professor Tata. Are we glad that you uh, be able to join us today? And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please give our poor attention to Professor Tata. Professor, the room is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to our moderator, uh, Prisma, I guess. And uh, yeah, I would like to say thank you to the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, uh, Universitas Negeri Padang, to the Vice Rector uh, for inviting me as a keynote uh, in this uh, ninth ICT VET which is, I can say, is a very precious uh, uh, conference. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me share my uh, slides first. So, yeah. Um, to our moderator, can you see the slide? Yes, okay, so uh, I would like to share about um, the future skill sets for human capital development in smart and circular economy. Uh, this topic is uh, widely discussed all over the world, actually, by the TVET scholar. So, um, yeah, I would like to share it in this nine IC TVET uh, to all the participants. So, uh, this um, Smart and circular economy got uh, has to do with the uh, IR 4.0, which is about um, industrial revolution of 4.0. Uh, so um, all over the world are looking for circular economy as well as developing a smart city, uh, smart economy, and and so on. So uh, let me share my slide. I will begin with why why do you need a, a new skill set why do you need a future skill set what happened with the those uh, previous uh, skill sets so um there is a, a, a major changes in work and life profession uh, development of tvet or in in the world of work actually so uh, there are new jobs coming up which is uh, um, 24 million new jobs in greening by 2030. So greening technology or greening skills uh, is essential at this uh, in this era of fourth industrial revolution. And another uh, aspect why the major changes in world of work is because uh, we should uh, filling new shortages uh, in digital literacy and also short shortage of uh, the technological skill workers uh, in future. And another aspect is about creating new business. Um, in this era, there is a new mindset of uh, entrepreneurship uh, because of the technology changes uh, rapidly and uh, involvement of the technology in, in entrepreneur. We should develop uh, entrepreneurial mindset and also entrepreneurial skills uh, related to the needs of the era. Entrepreneurship fastest growing skills demand up to 30% uh, 
by 2030, uh, which is stated by uh, OECD and International Labour Organization, ILO. And, and then there is another aspect, which is over 50% growth from innovation depends on skills. Uh, so that is why uh, Tibet is very important. Uh, all the developed country uh, develop um, the country, the economy of the country by uh, developing the skills of their human capital. And uh, we cannot forget about uh, digital greening entrepreneurship, which new generation of transversal skills for new generation of jobs. So it needs transversal skills. So I will explain a little bit about transversal skills um, to be embedded or to be adopted by, by all the graduates and also students. And the last part is uh, major changes in world of work is about uh, the routine cognitive or routine work and manual skills is, is getting uh, less or no longer uh, needed in the future. So as mentioned by McKenzie research, 15% drop in demand for routine skills. So uh, this is another uh, findings uh, from our Malaysian de uh, Department of Skills Development. As we can see the demand of management and academic work getting higher uh, by 2030 actually. So at the moment, uh, the, the needs is about 15%, but towards IR 4.0, it increased to nearly 20%. And as you can see, for both uh, TVET uh, skills, which is, pardon, uh, I have to, okay. So for both TVET uh, professionals and highly skilled and as well as skilled, uh, there is a big, uh, increment in the percentage uh, needed in the industry. Uh, for TVET professional, it is about 25% and the increment is about 19% uh, from what being what we are having now. And the skilled workers from 7% to nearly 30 to 35%. So there are big changes in the uh, major, major changes in the world of work where it needs more TVET professionals or high skill uh, workers and skilled workers. As you can see, the semi-skilled workers uh, at the moment uh, in Southeast Asia and also Asia, I can say, which is in Malaysia and Indonesia too, uh, we are having 72% of semi-skilled workers. But in future, it will go down to until 30 to 35%. So, um, that is why we need uh, to look into this future skill sets uh, in the new era of economy, which is smart and uh, circular economy. Uh, this is some data from, uh, I mean, uh, from my, my colleagues where we present our, our uh, TVET research in ASWET, Asian Academic Society of Vocational Education and Training uh, from China. With the industrial 4.0, the demand for low skill workers is, is decreasing, while the demand for middle and high skill workers is increasing. So the need of frontline skill operators greatly reduced due to the intelligent, intelligent manufacturing. And there is a huge decrease in the demand for the secondary vocational education, which trains the blue collar workers. Same goes to uh, Japan's uh, I mean, uh, Tibet or um, industrial needs. As you can see, the upstream process, uh, high skill worker um, is getting higher and also middle skill work as support for high skill work is higher. But the production uh, procurement job related to manufacturing and procurement job uh, getting less and less in the future. This is because of uh, the internet of things, rob many things that happens in this uh, era. So um, that is in change. Eh? The, this trend shapes the work of the future. How do we prepare for these uh, futures? So um, yeah, as my, my 
keynote, uh, I mean, speech is about uh, circular economy and also a smart economy. I would like to explain a little bit about uh, this circular economy. So uh, in the past years, the traditional model is that we buy, consume and dispose. But uh, in the term of circular economy, it is defined that a system that is restore, restorative or regenerative by intention and design that can be achieved by eliminating waste through the superior design of material product system and within this uh, business model. There is no more uh, the traditional way of uh, producing product or inventing something which is just to buy, consume and dispose, but we have to uh, restorative and regenerative uh, the products. This is a new uh, way of business. Um, yeah, this is the previous uh, type of business, which is in engineering and also in TVET and, and other ap applied science where um, consumers or industries uh, develop something, make something, manufacture something, and consumers use uh, the products. And at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, a waste, a dump, uh, which is uh, in, in research, 30% of the materials economy are in the dump, actually. So uh, this is circular economy. As a TVET and also engineering courses, we should uh, inculcate, uh, inculcate or embed this uh, idea of circular economy, where we need a skills um, of something that can be uh, reused, recycled, repair, and so on. As you can see, a linear economy, where um, this is one example, like fertilizer factory, and then uh, farming, and goes to the consumer, and at the end of the day, it goes to the uh, excess slush will go to the river. But in circular economy, it will be recycled and the river will maintain uh, clean yeah? and can be used for other purposes. So uh, in engineering and also technical and vocational, um, I mean, uh, program, we should uh, I mean, embed this in our curriculum to develop uh, our students' skills to think of the loop for the economy. So the circular economy, um, I can say that there is no more uh, three R, there are seven R's, which is uh, we should uh, develop our human capital or our students with the idea of to redesign, reduce, reuse, repair, renovate, recycle, and also recover. So uh, as you can see from my slide, uh, what is about design? We have to redesign, reform, respect, restore, and so many things about design. And about uh, manufacturing, uh, restabilize, revamp, uh, and also uh, recycle is not only just recycle, but we can also recover, refurbish, repair, repurpose, and so on. So this is about uh, the circular economy. So uh, if you think of circular economy, meaning that you have to develop a new skills to the students, a new skills to the employees, which is how to, to save uh, the world, how to save the energy, and so on. So these are some of the ideas of how to uh, embed or integrate uh, the, the program or the courses in our uh, engineering or TVET uh, program. Um, UNESCO also uh, take this um, circular economy as something which is very important, uh, especially in the uh, undeveloped country. Uh, circular economy is mainly based on three principles, which is preserving, enhance, enhancing natural capital by controlling uh, non renewable resources and balancing renewable resource flows, keeping products and material in use at most in biological and technical cycles, designing out waste and negative environmental externalities such as pollution. So, uh, yeah, I will skip this slide. Maybe I'll go further about the transversal skill. So, as I mentioned uh, in my first slide, this is about future skills. 
where we need more transversal skills in our students as well to the employees, the new employees. So what is a transversal skills, which is uh, about uh, working with others, work professionalism, uh, self-management, digital uh, literacy, and also problem solving and decision making as, and as well as citizenship, ability to, to uh, confidently demonstrate intercultural understanding through working in diverse groups. Uh, these are some of the uh, transversal competencies that need to be uh, developed in our students in order to compete in the 21st century era in the IR industry, fourth industrial revolution, and also in smart and circular economy. So we cannot only um, having technical skills, uh, just technical skills, how to repair, how to uh, troubleshoot, but we also need uh, interpersonal skills, intrapersonal skills, and so many things. So um, this transversal skills is actually a, a broad skills, and also it is considered as deep skills, so which are a boundary for crossing competencies. So such as teamwork, communication, uh, perspective, uh, networks, critical thinking, robot understanding, and project management. This is what we call as transversal skills. So we have to check on this uh, to our students. And uh, in, so in some programs, they already embed, as you can see in Italian higher education system. In master's program, they have this circular economy uh, courses, which is about sustainable chemistry and technology. In postgraduates, they have uh, courses such as bioeconomy in circular economy. In high and seasonal schools, also the circular economy being embedded uh, in the curriculum. So, uh, circular economy is uh, the, I mean, uh, it started in 2016 and being uh use or being uh, considered uh, uh, by the industries uh, in europe um, and also uh, in in developed countries such as uh, japan and and korea but it is it is less considered in southeast asia uh, countries so uh there are a few examples uh, uh, given in these uh, slides and another thing is the skills that we need to uh, to have is about the skills that the smart economy uh, is an economy based on technological innovation. So resources, efficiency, sustainability, and high social welfare. So smart economy adopts innovation and new entrepreneurial initiatives, increase productivity and competitiveness. So uh, the main goal for smart uh, city is to optimize city functions and promote economic growth. So do our engineering and uh, TVET graduates, um, I mean, uh, uh, we, do we really support this smart uh, economy or the smart city aspect? As you can see here, uh, in, in smart economy, or we can say it being translated into smart uh, city, which uh, in a lot of countries are developing smart cities, such as in Indonesia and Malaysia. So um, the needs of smart uh, economy is about smart living. So relatively high crime index, increasing demand for healthcare services, and about smart economy, so low productivity in current economy. It is about low readiness for transition, a weak development of innovative business, and so on. These are the issues, uh, and the issues should be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, eliminated by the uh, the new technology. And how do they they uh, integrate uh, latest uh, components in smart city? So smart city components and characteristic is about smart digital infrastructure. So if you think of smart digital infrastructure, you should have, um, I mean, workforce ready for this smart digital infrastructure. Uh, you cannot on, only uh, understand what is smart digital infrastructure by 
uh, developing or producing your human capital or your resources to support uh, the smart city. So smart city needs smart digital infrastructure, uh, flexible and affordable models of transport, comprehensive network, widespread adoption of high-speed internet, enhanced personal data protection. And in smart city, uh, of course, uh, the economy being developed is smart economy, high productivity, innovation in all sectors of economy, utilization of ICT in economy, and competitive uh, economy and attractive uh, for smart city. And smart living, urban safety, security, high quality of health service, and uh, smart environment, which is to for, I mean, smart living, or we can say, for social well-being, high quality of life in housing areas, uh, clean environment, sustainable resources. And uh, at the end of the day, you will have smart people which uh, understand about low carbon city and green lifestyle, empowered uh, community, talented human capital, community with good uh, moral values, uh, and so on. So, um, so every country uh, going for this uh, smart city and circular economy, as you can see, the components of uh, and characteristic of smart city need uh, institution, uh, I mean, to develop the human resource. So I'm, got, I'm not going to list the, the skills that the future skill sets uh, one by one actually, but what I'm trying to tell is about we have to, in line with the, the government or the country uh, initiative in developing circular economy and also uh, the smart uh, economy. So in, in Thailand, they, they already have a few smart city in Thailand. As you can see, the components is also the same. In Indonesia, uh, in Jogja also, there is a smart, uh, it is also called a smart city. Uh, related to smart tourism and also smart education. So they developed Jogja uh, Istimewa uh, as smart urban services, uh, smart environment, smart mobility, smart government, and so on. Uh, last two weeks, I've been to uh, Lampung together with uh, my colleague in University uh, Indonesia under the tourism uh, department. They are looking uh, for research to develop uh, Bangkulu, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Bangkulu at Lampung uh, port as smart port or smart harbor. So Indonesia are, are developing a lot of smart city, but do uh, University of Padang, uh, do faculty of engineering and also TVET faculty or, or economy faculty into this, to support the, the smart city uh, development in Indonesia. Uh, so uh, in Malaysia also, we have a lot of smart city have been developed. Uh, the, the one that we have here is uh, Klang Valley. And we also have a smart city in Malacca, Kota Kinabalu, Kulim, Iskandar, Kuching, and also in Penang. So a uh, smart city is not only about the city, it is uh, comprehensive. It is about smart living, smart economy, smart industry. So uh, all of our programs and courses should be in line with all the sectors to develop smart economy and also uh, smart, uh, a circular economy. So uh, these are some of TVET uh, IR 4.0 framework, or I can relate it to uh, smart economy and also circular economy. Do we should have uh, IR technology pillar, which, which is about Internet of Things, big data ready. I mean, we should prepare our human resource uh, with these skills: Internet of Things, big data analytics, cloud computing, augmented reality, additive manufacturing, cyber security, autonomous robot simu simulation system integration. So um, these are important uh, for one country to develop, to be um, a developed country. And another part is about uh, skills that we've been talking for so long about 21st century skills. I think this is common for 
or educationist or academic institution which we should consider digital skills creativity problem solving communication and social skill continuous learning analytic skills and about industrial engagement uh, there is a needs of uh, industrial collaboration uh, i think all of the university are doing it but the most important thing is about these two aspect to support the um, future i mean human resource to support the industry and also to support the the country to develop smart economy and smart city and also, uh, as we can see, there are a few things about uh, IR 4.0, uh, the changes related to physical, digital, and biological, how um, industry are de developing their technology by humanizing potential or humanizing technology, which makes something more human to give attribute to human character. These factors that affects the the workers of operators and also procurement jobs, which uh, make something more human, which is related to uh, what we call as RPA, robotic process automation, uh, where we use robotic um, virtual assistant perform simple and repetitive tasks, which used to be completed by human. Uh, with an application of AI RPA, a robotic process automation can be further developed into an enhanced business performance and also the engineering and productivity uh, uh, production process. So uh, as we can see here, in, in at the moment, digital workplace uh, in cognitive era has been introduced 2021 to 2019 and smart factory and digital twin but uh, later in 2030 artificial intelligence will take place in office and also in industry cyber physical system will take place in production uh, uh, for production uh, of products and so on so uh, it is um, something that we have to get ready of our student it does not mean that um, it is a disruptive innovation where some of the job will be uh, taking uh, place by robots uh, process automation, but we need to develop someone uh, at higher level uh, to develop this system or to troubleshoot or to develop new service types of uh, working environment. So Industrial Revolution 4.0 impact, as you can see, I think a lot of you have seen this uh, figure which is about mobiles, IoT, advanced uh, human machine interface, 3D printing, smart sensors, and so on. So these are some examples that uh, robotic automation process or IR 4.0 have taken place in in construction. Uh, I mean, uh, industry which is robotic brick layer. So as in Malaysia, we use a lot of uh, Indonesian workers to in this uh, construction. But later on, we are looking at um, developing a robotic automation process in construction. And also, uh, as you can see, a 3D printer. This is now a road printer. Okay? Road printer, how they develop a road using bricks to lay on uh, as a road so it's later i mean in 2030 uh, these things will happen widely and as you can see uh, additive manufacturing 3d printed house uh, this has been uh, in place uh, become reality so this is 3d printer house it can be developed using 3d a big 3d printer here and also up here for the whole of a uh, house, the construction of a house. So uh, if we still the de uh, developing skilled workers, uh, maybe in future, the skilled workers is no more needed in, in the country. Uh, so uh, we have to upskilling, reskilling uh, our students with the skills that being uh, that needed in 2030 and also 
uh, starts from 2023 and or 2025. Uh, these are some of the example about uh, unmanned uh, machines uh, for farming and also for security, uh, for monitoring and so on. Uh, so um, this is, I think, I guess this is my last slide. So the future skill sets uh, in smart and circular economy, it is about the fourth industrial revolution changes. And some says it's already the fifth industrial revolution with human and uh, machines interaction uh, has, in, in, has been in place in, in Japan and also Germany and also Korea. So uh, at the moment, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia is still in the fourth industrial revolution, and maybe some of the sectors is still in the third industrial revolution. But for the fourth industrial revolution, uh, some generic skills which you cannot take off from your uh, to develop for your students is about uh, the nine skills: critical thinking, communication, creativity, adaptability, leadership, emotional intelligence, digital management and problem solving. So we need, lastly, we need a fluid and industry relevant curriculum actually. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Satar for your uh, presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, as we said before, we, uh, we will have a question and answer uh, session. And we already have all right, we already have two questions, Professor. The first one is from Pa Nanang, and the question is, the impact of implementation of smart city reduce absorption of labor in the services provided by the institution. This increases the unemployment rate. What solutions are uh, can you suggest uh, for the version of displaced workforce due to the implementation of smart city. Yeah. I think we will, uh, you can answer uh, one, one question one by one. Yeah, um, firstly, we cannot avoid the advancement of technology. So we have to understand that we cannot avoid the advancement, advancements of technology. The industry, the government is always looking for high technology to uh, I mean uh, to generate income uh, for the country to become a richer country and so on. So uh, whether we like it or not, we have to uh, in line with the initiative of the government or the country, which is going for uh, a robotic automation process, going for the industrial uh, revolution. So there's a lot of unemployment will uh, arise, actually. It's true, it's true. But we have to find a way to suit with the development, actually. Uh, that is what we call as disruptive innovation. Uh, a new innovation will disrupt uh, the old way of work, the, the old work. That is why we call disrupt innovation so we ourselves has to be have, must look at and review our curriculum as soon as possible or must must always alert with the changes so we have to integrate the especially the digital literacy uh, all the skills that being needed by um, the industry we cannot stop industry because there are a lot of jobs uh, required, uh, they, they require students to have, I mean, skills um, by function, okay? So by function, it's no more that you have degree in mechanical, degree in automotive, they, they need you can, to be performed by function. Can you design using this? Can you uh, do this? Can you do this? So that is how it works uh, nowadays. So uh, with our traditional uh, curriculum, we have to embed a new technology. I have one uh, experience um, um, evaluating uh, 
uh, and give accreditation to one engineering department. So I call upon the industry people. They said the student is good, but it is uh, not enough, actually. The lack of digital uh, literacy. So now uh, the industry needs someone uh, that can help them in digital digitalization aspect. So all the service being changed to digital, especially uh, the inventory, the stock, and also on, uh, and also the production. So we have to find way to fill the gap. So in my university, mm -hmm. all the students in engineering being given a new technology, whether uh, by in uh, by formal education or informal education. So we cooperate with the industry like um, Federation of Manufacturing and they let us know these are the skills that being that needed. So we try to embed whether in the primary education, I mean in the, the uh, their program or outside their program, informal. So we have a checklist and so on. What are the skills that that uh, in is needed uh, nowadays? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now for the second question is from wait. From Mr. Ashabul, and the question is how to combine uh, STEM with local wisdom. I think it's uh, regarding the smart city, maybe. Yeah. So how to combine the STEM with the local wisdom, Professor? Okay, uh, STEM, STEM actually, the, the end product uh, of STEM, I mean, for human capital development is about uh, creating uh, human capital to become innovative, creative, and inventive. Mm -hmm. That is the purpose of STEM. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not just for developing uh, student literacy, students' uh, psychomotor skills. That is not enough for STEM. Okay, so we Malaysia also uh, embarking on STEM uh, quite extensively. All the universities helping the schools. Uh, I mean, uh, for STEM uh, development. So um, in Tibet, actually, or in engineering, we normally teach students and uh, about courses by courses. That is not STEM, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, that is not STEM. But what we need is that the students should um, using a problem orientation, which is in context with the real situation, to develop something to solve the problem related to maybe sustainable development goal. Mm -hmm. So it is about project uh, problem orientation and project oriented. And mm -hmm. at the same time, the integration of STEM is, is uh, needed because uh, STEM with STEM, then only you can develop a good product uh, to look into the green technology and to look into the environment friendly and so on. Without that, you, you cannot have a good product from engineering or TVET. Uh, so what we are having now in Malaysia, we are not trying to produce TVET graduates uh, with all the skills and literacy. We are trying to develop uh, students with highly manufacturing mindset, innovation mindset, inventive mindset, uh, and so on, and, and also entrepreneurial mindset by taking consideration of STEM elements. There's no way or no product in the world that can be sell, mm -hmm. uh, be used by all the uh, by consumers without have a uh, safe and having all the STEM elements. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the lacking aspect in Tibet, uh, Tibet students, especially mm -hmm. in Malaysia. So we produce students with high skill, but they only can perform as an operator, high skill operator, but they cannot invent and innovate something that can be, uh, I mean, sell uh, globally. So STEM uh, has its own uh, fundamental, which is about developing students to be more innovative, creative, inventive, and, and also entrepreneur. So you need to, 
uh, have programs that can develop these skills. Uh, not a program that only develops students uh, psychomotor skills, just using, or, or let's say uh, you, you, the students know how to use 3D printer, that is not STEM. The students know how to use uh, what we call uh, all the embedded uh, microcontroller Arduino, that is not STEM actually. But what uh, a lot of people understand, if you are in engineering, you are STEM. If you are in uh, Tibet, you are STEM, but actually it's not. So you need to develop someone to produce something, uh, which is about innovation, invention, and also, uh, I mean, related to uh, entrepreneurship, which you can sell your product. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we still have time to answer the question. I, uh, the third one is from Arif Rahman Hakim from PT PCI Electronic International, Batam. Uh, he asked about how to develop this new skill for the employees. Pardon? How to? Uh, develop this new skill for the employee. And oh, okay. can you suggest what method uh, we can apply? Okay. Um, the, the circular economy is in place already in the industry, especially in the Europe. So the trend of uh, industry is using all the ways uh, and also the what we call as uh, um, I mean, all the ways to become, uh, to develop a new product and to uh, develop a new industry using waste. As you can see just now, my, my slides is about how the old computer being, uh, being uh, re not repaired, uh, taken all the parts to produce another product. Uh, so um, I have a student that carry out this research and also I have a partner actually in University of Indonesia from tourism. We are looking at circular economy uh, program as I have shown just now about what are the program that you should be embed in your tourism, which is about, uh, which is related to circular economy. And one example is that, uh, let's say my student are doing uh, her PhD now about, um, can I take a spell in, in Bahasa? Uh, program Penyediaan Makanan and Penyajian Makanan. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in, in, in restaurants, there, there's a lot of waste. Okay. There's a lot of waste. Mm -hmm. So in the uh, institution also, in these courses, a lot of waste. So they just uh, throw it away. But in circular economy, how the waste can be transformed into something uh, or can be benefit to something. It can be a new production mm -hmm. from the waste. So mm -hmm. uh, as I showed just now, maybe I can just glance through, sorry, I'll just take about a very short period. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to develop this. Okay, this is how we use the recycles to produce another goods mm -hmm. that is in the real of work. But in institution, you need to develop activity on cl closed loop economy. So in, in my case, my student PhD are developing uh, courses related to food uh, technology and how this closed economy will uh, a model of closed economy in food technology aspects. So, so for each engineering uh, courses, you need to develop um, what we call as uh, um, uh, teaching planning, how the waste of the product from your, uh, um, from your activities can be reused and repair and so on. So that is how you teach your students uh, to think or to have mindset of close uh, economy. There are a lot of example in close economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, be, and then there is, this is another aspect of close economy where you can have this close economy as an elective subject. Uh, 
close economy or circular economy is about sustainability of economy. So you can have uh, for postgraduate subject like environmental, sustainable and circular economy, you can have activities and you can have uh, a practical on circular economy and also close economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Professor, we still have one question. It's yes, please. Risky. And the question is, economic uh, aspect aside, what do you think is the biggest challenge for Southeast Asian countries in developing uh, a smart uh, city? Is it the human resources, the skill, or maybe the mindset? Yeah. Uh, yeah, as for me, I can see the the resources is one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. because if you human resources or uh, uh, the human resources is not the resources, the resources is already there. Like uh, uh bang bangkahulu, I think bangkulu, bangkulu, uh, bung bungkulu, eh? uh, port. The resources is there. You have the port. You have all the fishery activities, and you have all the uh, what we call as uh, blue economy aspect, which is about uh, renewable energy, fishery, and so many things. You have all the resources, but you need to have a good human resources to develop the smart city. That's where comes the institution to help uh, the district or the government uh, to develop smart city. Because in our meeting last two weeks in Lampung, uh, there are someone from the ministry, from the district, and also from the university under the tourism discuss about, uh, they already have in plan mm -hmm. to upgrade the, the area to become a, a smart harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the plan cannot be realized, uh, cannot be implemented without, um, I mean, the help of the academic institution to develop the human resources, mm -hmm. okay? So they need a lot of uh, skills, uh, which is about digital literacy, cybersecurity, about uh, business related to online and so on. And also the, you have to remember that the, the what population or the people should be uh, also considered uh, as part of your smart city in developing the smart city. So I think human resources is, is the most important thing. The important thing, the technology and the resources is already there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Professor Sata. Uh, okay, we still have questions, but uh, I'm afraid that we already arrived to our at the end of our session, Professor Sata, because we... Uh, we still have two uh, keynote speaker, and that's it. So on behalf of all the committee, I would like to say thank you, Professor, for joining us today, for delivering interesting and fruitful presentation, for the fascinating explanation, and we do hope that you enjoy your time with us uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. We wish you great success in the future. Hopefully, we will meet you again sometime in the future in person. And we will be very happy to have you here in Padang. Yeah, Thank me you. too. Looking forward to, I mean, yes. see all of you somewhere in, in Indonesia or in Malaysia later. Okay. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give some applause to our speaker, Professor Muhammad Tata Basu. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our second keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Fima Kumar. I believe that he already with us. Dr. Fima, are you with us? Ah. Good morning, Dr. Fima Kumar. Should I call you uh, Dr. Fima or Dr. Kumar? We, we can't hear you, I think. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Pima, uh, we cannot hear you yet.
I think there's something wrong with your um, speaker, maybe. No. Still cannot hear you. Okay. No, not yet. Uh, not yet, not yet, Dr. Fima. Uh, maybe you can try without uh, the hand free or the headset, maybe. Uh, still cannot hear you. And meanwhile, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Akar share his uh, contact. So you can contact him through email, drchata at ukm.edu.my. Thank you so much, Professor Sata. Or maybe you can leave the room first, uh, Dr. Fima, and then joining us again. Maybe what to try. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will be waiting for uh, Dr. Fima Kumar to joining us again. There's something wrong uh, with his speaker or uh, computer. I cannot hear you all.
Which one? Ah, uh, wait, wait. Have you joined the audio profile when you uh, entering the room, uh, Dr. Pima? Uh, we cannot hear you. Yes. Mm -mm. Yes, he already uh, tried not using the uh, headset. <laughs> I think he left the room again and tried to join us later. Should we stay? Um, yeah. What are Hello. Yes. Ah. Finally. Uh, am I audible? Yes. 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 Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I tried on uh, this uh, application, mm -hmm. but uh, yesterday I had meeting. Uh, oh. it, it was working, but I, I, I don't know why it is not connected. But mm -hmm. okay, finally we are connected. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So. All right. So good morning. Uh, Dr. Kumar, how are you? Good, good. <laughs> in what city are you right now? Are you in Choyang? Yes. Uh, how, was, uh, how is the weather over there? Good, good. Weather is uh, almost here, uh, mm -hmm. 28, 29 degrees. So weather is quite good, Yeah, but winter season now. <laughs> oh, it is winter season. Okay. Yes, uh, till Feb uh, end. Okay. Can you see my slide? 
Yes, okay. yes. But uh, first, before you deliver your presentation, allow me to introduce you to our audience. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, our uh, second keynote speaker is Dr. Kimal Kumar. He is an assistant professor at the Department of Information Management, Chaoyang University of Technology, Taiwan. He obtained his PhD degree from Department of Industrial and Management Engineering, IIT Kanpur, India, with a thesis title relating critical success factor and culture through strategic orientation and leadership for TKM implementation in Indian firms. His professional objective is to create opportunities for the betterment of society and his own uh, career advancement through research and teaching in scientific exploration of data and application of facts. His area of working and research interests, including uh, total quality management, manufacturing strategy, modeling in logistic and supply chain management, technological innovation and pattern analysis. He is currently working on a project entitled A Structured Approach to Explore Technological Redundancy and Knowledge Flow Through Pattern Citation Network by Integrating TLC Indicator and Main Path Analysis. Uh, this project is supported by most or Ministry of Science and Technology Taiwan. Dr. Uh, Kumar has been invited to deliver speech and talk in academic and scientific events in several countries, including India and Taiwan. And he is also an editorial board member for IEEE TEMS uh, since January 2020. He already published several books and book chapter and many uh, academic uh, writing or articles. And that's uh, the, uh, about our uh, speaker, our second keynote speaker. And now, uh, Dr. Pima, uh, the room is yours, please. Okay, thank you for a nice uh, introduction. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Vimal Kumar. Uh, currently, I am working here at CYUT, uh, Taiwan. Uh, I am going to uh, present one of my work that is uh, quite related to everyone like we have our you know left brain right brain how do we think how do we behave with others and how like our behavior our everything related to our thinking process so what we think so this is quite interesting to everyone like uh, here what we think what we do so how our brain command our activity okay so basically this work is related to uh, tqm focus but hopefully uh, I expect everyone to, you know, relate or connect with our uh, daily schedule or our mindset. Okay. So <clears throat> this is my uh, work title that is relating left and right brain uh, dominance type of leaders to TQM focus. So this is not only about that TQM leaders, but in our general, general life, what we think, okay, that is how our uh, mind command our left and right uh, parts of our body that how we connect how do our activity perform okay so this is the outline of uh, my presentation uh, I start with objective summary and then introduce my work uh, go with some literature work then how some methodology suitable methodology followed and then we come to result discussion findings uh, and uh, conclusion okay so before going to start in a broad way i i would like to uh, just uh, give my brief uh, give brief introduction about total quality management. So when we think about this TQM, TQM is quite related, you know, industrial engineering, uh, mechanical work, and this management work. So basically, this TQM is made up of three words, total, quality, and management. So when we define total, so total means connecting everyone. When people connect, when employee connect, when staff connect, supplier, distributor, our manufacturing company, everybody involved here, our uh, retailer, wholesaler, everything, the participation of everyone is our total, okay? When we involve machine, when we involve employee, when we involve top management to bottom level of employee, these all are total, okay? When we define quality, so quality is simple, basic features and characteristics of any product, any service, that is simple. 
quality when we talk about management so management is the process of dealing with anyone process of dealing with employee dealing with industry top management people and controlling everything okay that is simple management but when we uh, define total quality management in a broad way that is simply total quality management is integrated approach of having zero defect means no defect having good quality of product okay continuous improvement we focus on continuous improvement customer satisfaction customer requirement what customer exactly want from our manufacturing company that is our customer requirement customer satisfaction and when we talk about this good quality of product so having good quality of product is very important for any company and from company side and customer side okay so uh, we know these things and we will try to relate our this study to this tqm focus okay so the overall objective of this study is how we find that different tqm focus and why these two many of our uh, tqm focus define in a broad way but here we consider only two different opposite way that what define continuous improvement and innovation so everybody knows you know this uh, innovation creativity do not need to define but we will go one by one and explain and try to relate with my study okay when tqm leaders have their different approaches and support to tqm in terms of support strategic planning decision making and try to relate them to tqm uh, continuous improvement and innovation so here uh, <clears throat> we try to get data from 111 uh, companies and uh, justify our this study okay so when we talk about this, our left brain or right brain or human being, so human being are the only mammals whose left and right brain are specialized for quite different functions. We have different minds and some, some, many people are, you know, left, uh, left hand uh, writing and other thing, all activities do. And so many people uh, do all activities by right hand. Okay. So like how we relate with our, you know, right hand activity with our left brain and left brain, uh, right brain connect with our left left hand activities okay <clears throat> so many researchers many authors who have given you know dominance type instrument to measure this kind of uh, activities in in our society in our employee in 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 our manufacturing company to and how they teach that our left brain thinkers are different from right right brain we have two different or and we have only this kind of you know opportunity to think about our left and right brain uh using okay and and they give the different thinking techniques to better result in their mission critical areas so we think that you know uh, uh in, in in a different way like continuous improvement and innovative things the thinking style of leaders and theory of the structure and functions of the mind suggest that two different sides of the brain control two different modes of thinking so only that right and left but actually our brain is divided into four part how they have left top left bottom right top right bottom so usually like we how our day to day activities relate to our left and right brain thinking when we have you know a uh, 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 kind of thinking when we have we do not understand what is right and what is wrong what is positive what is negative so somehow our both mind connect together so that's why we we are in dilemma like what what is correct what is not correct you know so this kind of thinking we generate using this kind of uh, approach with this kind of uh, instrument so in addition today's competition continuous improvement and innovation need considerable attention as having the crucial role in securing sustainable competitive advantage and many researchers have concluded them for long term survival of the organizations so here in in this study we consider that how our top management people or top leaders what they think in in the company in our manufacturing company okay so when we define continuous improvement so it is the ongoing process simply continuous means day by day regularly improvement improve ourselves okay so this is continuous improvement is the ongoing process to remedy the workflow for the betterment of the organizations moreover le leaders are taking action to attain continuous improvement by small changes as improve to tqm rather than radical changes so radical changes is drastically changes in one day changes but continuous improvement we cannot jump over the process we cannot skip any process so that's why we follow uh, uh, continuous improvement we cannot go to third year from first year 
we will follow our first semester second semester third semester fourth semester then we get you know more knowledge about our uh, and uh, brush up our skill and knowledge okay so this is kind of you know in our life in our real life we follow continuous improvement okay so there are different steps in continuous improvement when team members examine each step of determine when the bottleneck like challenges difficulties occur then reduce to defect and improve customer satisfaction so each and every step we try to follow to improve them okay in today's uh, business environment there is no executive task more vital and demanding that the sustained management of innovation and changes to compete in the ever changing environment comp companies must create new product service and process to dominate they must adopt innovative innovation as the way of corporate life so how one employee one leader follow the in innovation innovative things how one leader follow continuous improvement but when we talk about this total quality management every day we follow the improvement process okay so the drivers of every company to sustain all other companies and competitors has accelerate both employees and organizations to come continuously search for new ideas new process of work <coughs> products and services and new strategies order to adopt survive and grow in the rapidly changing business environment that is simply uh, innovation okay so we define these uh, continuous improvement and innovation in a different way when we talk about left and right brain leaders so they have you know like we all have our different mindset okay so but you know both left and right uh, cerebral hemisphere have distinctive roles and play important though different roles in functional part of body like simply uh, when we think about this our left brain so left brain controlled our right hand right parts of body activities our right brain control our left part of body all activities okay so that's why you know we say that uh, left hander you know left hander very smart why just because they are right brain active always active but right handed person as compared to left handed are lower than okay so because our left brain active at that time so the left brain might contain an extensive number of neural tracts and structural associated associated okay so overall the results of these studies suggest that the left brain is involved more heavily with the phonological while certain non verbal functionals have been found to be handled largely by right brain okay so many things you know we do not go to biology but here in in a simple way what we think that how we connect with our body and brain to think about our you know day to day activities so in other words the left brain became the seat of self motivated behavior sometimes called top to down bottom control okay so the left brain of the left side of the brain leaders are responsible for rational logical and abstract cognition and conscious knowledge okay so the left brain world that itself defined you know you know many books uh, on our left and right brain available that is simply they talk about only that thinking that how to behave with our employees how to talk how to think about our uh, productive things okay so the left brain world would lead to increase bureaucracy a focus on quantity and efficiency over quality and the vo volume of the technology over human interaction and uniformity over uh, individualization okay so the characteristics of the left brain where we talk about only left brain are judgmental tactical planning and organization data analysis in what areas they are expert right brain leaders in what area they are expert okay so when we talk about this left brain financial budgets and calculations sequential controlled routine persistent thinking concern with administration safety being maintaining you know many n number of activities we have controlled by our left brain and right brain okay from the simple beginning process of the right brain to primary control of potential uh, dangerous circumstances that called for the rapid action you know when we take quick decision so sometimes our quick decision helped by our right brain okay so how do we think how do we take you know sometimes in uh, in uh, casualty in uh, in uh, miss happening case how do we think quick quick decision we take okay so our left brain helped at that time so in any process when we think about you know 
so how how we define so most important question is how we define our left brain and right brain thinking so when the characteristics when we talk about our characteristics of our right brain that is you know creative thinking people intuitive symbolic value based thinking concerned with our communication training imaginative special metaphorical uh, flexible idea intuitive n number of characteristics we have our right brain okay so when we connect like this is a pictorial uh, picture that we think that you know how we define our upper left lower left upper right lower right and they have they have some different functions when we talk about logical analytical fact based quantitative you know that is controlled by our upper left when we talk about lower left that is organized sequential planned detail so these characteristics belong to our left brain okay when we talk about our right so that is holistic intuitive integration synthesizing this is controlled by our upper right when we talk about lower right that is interpersonal feeling based kinesthetic emotional lower right so we all know that how we uh, our day to day activities our in our manufacturing company in our process how we relate with our brain you know many people emotional many people don't they don't have any emotions so like how we relate this kind of uh, behavior when we you know follow uh, to our employees when we go with our employees like how we follow our behavior that is controlled by you know left brain right brain so simply that so here the important thing is how we uh, connect this uh, left brain and right brain leaders with our continuum and a continuous improvement and innovation okay so in broad way like everybody knows you know that continuous improvement how it is defined so simply continuous improvement defined by uh, that uh, meaning of kaizen okay so kaizen means simply that change and zen means uh, good so always we try to do better and better every day so always we change for betterment we do not do our anything that uh, uh, decline our pr productivity so always we do uh, some you know good changes for our uh, productive work okay or in our services or in our uh, production always we do betterment you know and our our performance we compare with our previous result like what did we do in our uh, last year one financial year what what how much production we did how much uh, uh, revenue generated so everything we compare with our previous same like in you as a student uh, our student think about you know that every semester uh, uh, improvement like 8.9 percentile you know uh, 8.9 cgpa 9 cgpa 9.5 cgpa every semester they get improvement so where we get this idea from our past result okay so every time we think about our improvement so many researchers many authors they they define this continuous improvement is a pro program to reduce order processing times service development cycle time service delivery time cycle time and <clears throat> as well as reducing paperwork and to find wasted time and cost in all the incremental so here when we talk about this tqm always we try to reduce the cost we do not expend more and more to improve the quality no here the important thing is we need to improve the quality but we try to reduce the cost so here less cost high quality that is the most most important thing and focus on less wastage or almost no wastage okay and without defect we try to always improve the process that's why continuous improvement is very important key factor in our total quality management okay so <clears throat> that uh, uh, bounds uh, he uh, defined that the tqm teaches managers to engage in our root cause of you know analysis find the different problem brainstorming and then we conclude our product uh, productivity process okay so here you know another researchers that david said that continuous improvement does not mean only repeated small improvement along with improvement of any size you know it's not small improvement but in a betterment okay always try to think about not only that broad but small changes that can help to improve the overall productivity of any company okay so elliot identify tqm implementation through continuous improvement and marketing department of organization should complete in adopting tqm approaches to continuous quality improvement okay <clears throat> in another way like in another things we define innovation so innovation by its name you know creativity innovation itself uh, is a broad way how to 
uh, uh, produce innovative things. You know, many many startups, many many companies in a starting way they define innovation, and because of these innovative products, they come to uh, into the market to to sell their new products. You know, so same like any when when we talk about any uh, products, they always you know they have yeah, there are. Uh, different department they always focus on some new innovative things always try to introduce new and new uh, innovative things and uh, launch their uh, product okay so when we talk about suppose that uh, mobile iphone iphone 14 so something you know they change the five uh, percent only the innovative things rest 95 percent same like you know iphone 13 so no other things so, so only just five percent of improvement important here that is quite innovative things Okay, so in the modern complex business world, innovation has become the basis of cre for creating and sustaining competitive competitiveness, which also shows that the integration at TQM and innovation is possible by using an evolutionary process to develop business excellence. In order to avoid failure, the organizations always try to achieve better innovation. You know, always same like continuous improvement. We always like because innovation either we talk only about you know pass and fail. If it is okay, correct way we launch. Otherwise, we try to work more and more on that. Okay, so here that it uh, you know in business success, improve business performance, and foster competitiveness, and many organizations worldwide have their adoption of TQM principles. So TQM principle itself uh, defined in a broad way, but how uh, quality our quality department in manufacturing company or in service sector how they follow our TQM approaches. Okay, so many organizations always try to get the competitive advantage in the market through technical innovation that process and product innovation and make the strong relationship with our quality management okay <clears throat> so in uh, this table what we saw here that how we define continuous improvement and innovation in a different way okay that when we talk about effect so effect we have long term uh, long lasting but undramatic but you know innovation we have short term but dramatic you know short term means suddenly you know when we get any innovative things we do hard work uh five years ten years but suddenly we get that uh, innovative result okay but continuous improvement we do the process improvement day by day when we talk about pace continuous improvement have small steps we follow one by one steps but innovation we have big steps <clears throat> when we talk about time frame so continuous improvement itself you know continuous and incremental but uh, this innovation is intermittent or non incremental suddenly we get the output suddenly we get the result that is our innovation when we talk about involvement so involvement of every everybody here in continuous improvement but only few leaders selective leaders are in our innovative things you know some skilled worker they work on innovation but in continuous improvement we connect with all means everybody okay when we talk about different approach that is you know collectivism group effort and system approach in continuous improvement but in innovation it is rugged individualism individual ideas and effort okay so when we talk about different mode that is maintenance and improvement always we follow in continuous improvement step by step but in our uh, innovation we have different mode that is scrap and uh, rebuild okay so we think about innovative things spark when we talk about a spark that is conventional know how and state of the art but in uh, innovation that is technological breakthrough new invention and new theories new ideas we give okay when we talk about practical requirement for continuous improvement that is it requires little investment okay but greater effort to maintain it but in innovation it requires large investment but little effort to maintain it large investment we need when we talk about money so here in continuous improvement we need to spend a small amount but in in innovation many r d office you know in in company in our uh, university everybody they invest you know huge amount on innovation okay <coughs> when we talk about effort orientation so here people involved but here technology involved in innovation okay when we talk about evaluation criteria so here that process and effort for better result every day like 90 to 91 percent is a small change but every day we get a small percentage of changes okay but here in innovation we always wait for the result wait for the output and then 
get profit okay when we talk about advantage so here uh, works well in slope growth economy a small percentage but when we talk about innovation here it better suited for fast growing economy now we are living you know that uh, uh, fast growing environment you know everybody you know in you know everywhere we get competition high competition either in research either in company or in service sector everywhere we go we have high level of competition and if we fail in this competition we are out of the box okay same like you know manufacturing company n number of companies they produce n number of products similar products they produce in a different company but how to maintain their quality how to maintain their uh, cost how to maintain their innovative things you know different kind of competition they have so here in our uh, when we talk about hypothesis development so here by this you know past uh, theory here our left brain leaders we try to relate with our continuous improvement process and this right brain leaders they have innovative things so that's why we relate with innovation okay so there are two hypotheses and uh, from the uh, data collection we try to improve from the result we try to um, uh, justify that these two hypotheses are supported to our study or not okay so <clears throat> there are n number of theories uh, defined what we uh, explained what i explained uh, in our previous slide that how uh, left brain leaders are connected with uh, uh, continuous improvement and how right brain leaders are connected with our uh, 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 this uh, innovation okay so this already explained so when we talk about this uh, different methodology so total 111 uh, uh, data i got from different manufacturing company in different parts of india so mostly i target uh, on north part of india near delhi so here from you know this uh, uh, different uh, instrument i found that 54 leaders are left brain and 57 leaders are right brain okay so based on you know uh, 20 questions i find find found out that how many leaders are belong to belong to uh, left brain and how many leaders belong to right brain okay so basically and we check that how these left brain leaders uh, behave how our right brain leaders behave okay so basically when we talk about this you know and based on our characteristics based on our data we uh, based on our sample or variable uh, nature of variable we decide what kind of methodology we apply here okay so basically like uh, when we talk about there are two uh, variables that dependent and independent variable okay so here our independent variable have 25 items captured for the Herman brain dominance uh, thinking style inventory under investigation of left brain and right brain thinkers okay so <clears throat> there are 25 items and one uh, they all have a scale one to five is scale and based on this scale we try to relate what kind of characteristics belong to left brain leader what kind of characteristics belong to uh, left brain right brain leader okay and these two thinkers are independent variable which are considered as grouping variable so here grouping only we have two group left and right brain okay so in 100 sample size uh, 111 sample size 54 and 57 only two groups and our next study based on these two uh, groups of leaders okay when we talk about our dependent variable so we have total 13 items six belong to continuous improvement and seven belong to innovation okay and these are on likert scale so these are continuous uh, scale to measure and relate with our different leaders okay so before going to so when we have our independent variable grouping variable categorical variable and our dependent variable on continuous scale so based on these we try to implement here we try to apply here t test independent sample t test okay so this is a statistic process we applied we used uh, this uh, uh, S, or we solved this problem on spss using t test independent sample t test okay before going to apply our you know uh, solution method uh, we checked some assumptions okay like uh, how our data are normal everything connect with our you know uh, assumptions follow our assumptions or not okay so we i, I checked each and every uh, point okay so when we talk about you know independent sample t test so there are five uh, assumptions that grouping variable and 
when we make when we divide into two groups there is no relation of any employee or any type of leader with another group okay <clears throat> independent means one leader only belong to one group there is no matching there is no common thing belong to same or belong to two groups no if we talk about left brain they think about only left brain when we talk about right brain they think about only right uh, or innovative things okay so here our next assumptions that these questionnaire questions are measured by frequency distribution and identified their stronger thinking style okay <clears throat> the t test dis, uh, describe the mean value of continuous so here we checked mean we take standard deviation mean value okay of continuous improvement and innovation uh, as a variable okay and then we check that that significantly different or not it if if they have high level of significant value it means there is no relation between uh, left means there is no significant value if we get high value it means they have some similar thing it means they are not different when we get significant value it means they are two different okay and then relate with the left and right brain so on the other hand t test describe the mean value of innovation for left brain leaders is significantly differs from the mean value of innovation for right brain leaders okay so here we uh, prepared that null hypothesis alternate hypothesis and we try to justify our work here based on our result okay so our null hypothesis simply we checked with uh, this mean value of left brain leader and mean value of right brain leader okay and our alternate hypothesis that is not equal so these two hypothesis we try to justify uh, based on our analysis okay so we have using this spss software we get that mean value of left brain leaders uh, right brain leaders so we checked this mean value variance skewness for two okay and here that cronbeck alpha check the reliability of individual items okay <clears throat> and check the consistency of in each and individual item okay after that we applied here that levene test for assumptions okay that we check the equal equality of variance for assumptions or not so here we get that the value it is it is it should be greater than 0.05 okay so here if it is greater than 0.05 that it means equal variance if it is not greater than 0.05 it, it means unequal variance okay so here we get that two values that is 0.166 and 0.014 so here we check that that 0.014 is less than 0.05 it means here the case is unequal variance it means somehow it is not followed the uh, independent sample t test assumptions okay so basically another method uh, we apply if so if if anything not matched or followed by these assumptions okay so next thing we checked here you know normality that is safiro welk test here we check that significant value 0 0.017 0 0.019 okay this is quite you know uh, related to the statistic but it's uh, i will explain you know some managerial perspective <clears throat> next thing when we talk about you know we, when any assumptions fail we go to the next step that is our you know uh, different non parametric test so when all assumptions follow we use parametric test when if, you, if any assumptions failed we go to the non parametric test so here we when we applied non parametric test that is man witney u test for continuous improvement and innovation i got 0 0.00 okay significant value 0 0.00 it means that model is fit for applying our analysis process okay so here <coughs> it when we get less than 0 0.05 it means there is significant difference between left and right brain leaders okay so we get it means there is significant relation uh, significant value we have so when we have significant value then we go to our mean value okay so we checked here mean value of left brain leader for continuous improvement and left brain leader for innovation right brain leader for left uh, 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 continuous improvement and right brain leader for con uh, innovation so what we get here we have high value of uh, continuous improvement in left brain leader case we have high value of innovation in right brain leadership okay so based on this analysis we say that we can say that our left brain leaders for continuous improvement supported okay our right brain leaders for innovation so whenever this is you know only we read in our uh, you know uh, some our previous literature 
but nobody connected with this left brain and right brain leaders with our continuous improvement and innovation okay so in overall what we uh, what i conclude here that not only we we must be a manufacturing company or employee or in service sector employee in our general terms we have our certain characteristics of left brain and light right brain leaders and we try to connect with our uh, uh, leadership okay or suppose that like some if we don't know what i am i am left brain leader or right brain leader so i uh, we have this 25 instrument and based on 25 instrument we can relate with our left brain and right brain okay so even i checked i it is you know that is left brain leader so left brain leader means focus on continuous improvement day to day activity we improve okay not only in manufacturing company not only in service sector but every day in our life we improve day by day okay when we talk about innovation so innovation have different uh, <clears throat> characteristics right brain leaders have different characteristics and that is related to our uh, innovation okay so in overall study what we think about based on some characteristics based on some certain characteristics we relate our uh, uh, left brain and right brain activity to continuous improvement and innovation okay so this is uh, my overall uh, presentation if you have any question because after that you know n number of questions come in our mind because like how we decide that we have left brain or right brain okay <clears throat> Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pima Kumar. Uh, interesting uh, research. And we already have several questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Ms. Pina from Graduate School of UMP. Uh, she said, interesting research. Based on the conclusion, can you then suggest what kind of leader is the best for certain situation? Okay, so when we talk about when we talk about uh, this uh, TQM, we must have, you know, uh, left brain, uh, left brain leader. Mm. Yes, but yeah. you know, but we have some, you know, different team of leaders. They do, they focus on innovation. Mm -hmm. So for the TQM, uh, the best leader is the left uh, brain. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So can we can we then? Uh, make assumption that, uh, for example, for developing country, will it be better to have the left brain leader? Or is that, uh, you okay, know, you know uh, uh, we, when we say that left brain leader for TQM, it doesn't mean like it means we, we are not going to ignore right brain leaders. Okay, mm -hmm. like we must we need to balance our, you know, uh, all productivity. Somehow we need some innovation. Same like iPhone. You know, when we talk about iPhone 13 to iPhone 14, 95% mm. features, 95% characteristics are same. Mm. Only that 5% innovation. New mobile phone launch. Mm. When iPhone 15 will come, only 95% features are same as iPhone 14. But only that 5%, maybe camera or quality of camera or number of camera may be improved or some features some special um, sensor based or anything kind of improvement that is innovation so mm -hmm. only here 95 percent continuous improvement and five percent innovation okay mm -hmm. but still people are crazy for you know new mobile phone iphone 14 and <laughs> okay so the second question is all right so the question from mr arif rahman in our Oh, wait, wait, wait. We, oh, we already have many questions in our uh, room, uh, chat room. Uh, the second one is from uh, Mr. Nanang from Uni Universitas Pembangunan Nasional Veteran Jakarta. Uh, the question is, in the learning process in the classroom, has the identification of the right and left brain been applied in determining more effective learning methods or model? Yes. So, you know, when we, when we talk about our student, we have different thinking, you know, like we can see, we can observe that if we have 20 students, some mm -hmm. students are very intelligent, some students are not intelligent, okay, but we always focus on not intelligent, okay, mm -hmm. those who are not intelligent, like weak student, so if we improve their quality, that means our significant improvement, okay, intelligent people, if you give only idea, they will learn, 
but what what about our poor student how can we improve our poor student so based on this some characteristics already i explained here in in our previous slide but here based on you know we have logical thinking we have analytical thinking we have fact based so these are left brain characteristics when we talk about right brain they are holistic intuitive integration innovation many things they have characteristics but how they are related okay so some students are very innovative some students they need everyday improvement okay so what i believe i always focus on our weak student i always focus on our poor student because you know what like intelligent people is intelligent students if you give only idea they will learn mm, okay. yes interesting <clears throat> all right um uh, see in the chat room we have a question from uh, mr arif rahman hakim from uh, PT PTI Electronic International Batam, and he asked about how to identify a person or whether uh, he or she is left or right brain uh, person. Uh, so based on our this characteristic, so that Herman, one one uh, professor, one researcher, he has given twenty five uh, instrument. Okay, mm -hmm. so based on uh, instrument, uh, I will share that instrument. Uh, you you can go one by one question okay mm -hmm. there is some certain scale mm -hmm. and based on this uh, instrument after add your what kind what uh, how much score you get so based on score you can relate left and right okay so suppose that out of 20 uh, 25 if you get 18 so 18 belong to left brain it means you are left brain leader uh -huh. if in right brain leader right brain question if you correct 19 question out of 25 it means you are right brain leader okay so based on this uh, instrument we come to know that what kind of leaders have their different left or right brain okay uh, so there are uh, uh, an instrument with um, 25 questions yes yes all right um i think we all we only have uh, time for one question one more question and it come from miss primawati uh, I am a mathematics lecturer in mechanical engineering in Universitas Negeri Padang, and it is known that mathematics use or use more of the left brain. What are your tricks and tips for dealing with the right brain student in teaching math uh, material? Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about you know innovative teaching material, either you provide online or offline hard copy, anything you know. It depends on what happened. See, in our general term, before exam, we, we do hard work, okay? Mm -hmm. This is only that innovative things. Intelligent student can do, but poor student, weak students cannot do. It means they need continuous improvement to do everyday uh, improvement. So same like if you provide teaching notes, if you provide teaching material to, so like uh, I always uh, make my PPT, very simple way. My teaching materials, very simple way. I, I do not prepare my teaching materials for intelligent person. Intelligent person uh, already like he or she can understand, but for weak students, if you prepare in a very simple way, they can understand. Mm -hmm. So like, suppose that what happened, if you give very difficult formula, they cannot understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you give some brief idea before uh, e equations, they will, or some, you know, some basic introduction, they will understand. So mm -hmm. I always, you know, uh, prepare my lit, uh, notes or lit, uh, work only start with the introduction. Mm -hmm. So that's why my PPT becomes, you know, 20 slide, 30 slide for three hour lecture. Mm -hmm. And always in my class, always explain some basic thing also, because if you direct skip, like, you know, uh, intelligent students can understand, but what about weak student? And our, you know, everywhere, majority of weak students are higher, <laughs> so very high. So always I suggest, even I follow that our all teachers, that our teaching material should be, you know, very, very simple way. Because here uh, we make our student to understand, not for only exam, not for only grades, not for only score, but they, they need to follow, you know, they follow in their life. That is very important. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prima Kumar. I hope that helped uh, Ms. Prima Wati. And oh, please, one more question. It is interesting. Uh, the question is from uh, Mr. Ari from Faculty of Education Science. Uh, the question is, do you think that one day we can or we should choose our leader based on their psychological analysis, whether they are left yes. or... Yes, yes. Yes? Yes. Oh. yes. Why? See why like our means if we have same ideology mm -hmm. why we why we make good friend like why we make friend you know when we talk about our classroom you know first venture last venture mm -hmm. they have different mindset and first day they make their friend friend always you know intelligent student they make their own group weak student they make their own group mm -hmm. so here automatically you know smokers non-smokers non they make a different group you know <laughs> so everywhere they f like we always think about our ideology you mm -hmm. know if we have same same matching if we have our same behavior we 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 connect with our friend okay so same like when we choose our leader when we select our leader with same ideology you know when like leftist or uh, you know uh, right wing we have different ideology it means that ideology we follow it means our left leaders we follow, leftist leader, communist leader. So what does it mean? It means we have same ideology. We do not follow, like why, why we as a common people, why we oppose any leader? Because our ideology doesn't match. Okay. We, why we do not like any leaders? Why just because our ideology is not same? So we always prefer, we always want to choose our leader as a prime minister or president when we have same thinking same community same people so always people think about their own benefit their own betterment you know so always they choose their own ideology leader okay all right so um i'm afraid that we already have uh you know, uh, we already arrived to our, uh, this is the end of our uh, session. And I believe that uh, there's still an audience that wants to ask question uh, to you, Dr. P. Markumar. If you don't mind, maybe you can leave your contact uh, email for the audience so that they can uh, email you for their question. Yes, yes, I have mentioned my email. You know, if you have any doubt, any question, okay. anything, this is my second presentation. Uh, Okay. To, to this university, you know, so UNP, I already, you know, presented uh, mm -hmm. uh, in last symposium in June. So uh, Professor Rijki, she has, she had invited me. So this is my, you know, second uh, uh, presentation, second. Uh, so have you been to Padang? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Have you been to Padang? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Online, online. It was online. All right, all right. <laughs> yes. All right. So, me, definitely, yeah. I will come. Yes. <laughs> so, Dr. Uh, Pima Kumar, uh, I think that is our session for today. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the committee, I would like to say thank you so much for joining us today for delivering a very interesting presentation for answering the question from the audience. And we really enjoy our time with you. Uh, we hope that you too. And we wish you greater success uh, in the future with your project and research. And hopefully one day you can visit us uh, in Padang so that we sure, can sure, be sure. in person. Thank you, thank you. And my mail ID is mentioned here, uh, mm -hmm. this one. So if you have any, any, any question or if any student have any question, like we can uh, discuss here or anyone can email me. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank Have you. a nice weekend. <laughs> you too. Have a nice day and weekend. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, let's give uh, our speaker some applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, um, let's continue our session with the third keynote speaker for today. I believe that most of the audience already uh, know him. Uh, whether as our lecturer or as our dean uh, in Faculty of Engineering, uh, Universitas Negeri Padang. Uh, he is Dr. Fahmi Riza. Uh, 
uh, associate professor uh, Fahmi Riza. He obtained his master and doctoral degree in research and evaluation from Universitas uh, Negeri Jakarta. And his research area include analysis of soft skill in vocational education, evaluation of education, design and ICT technology in TVET. He has published many articles in index journals, in, most of them regards to soft skill and ICT in learning. And since 2016, he is the Dean of Faculty of Engineering of Universitas Negeri Padang. All right, so now, ladies and gentlemen, please give our full attention to Dr. Fahmi Riza. Pak Fahmi, the time and the room is yours. Thank you, Ibu Didi. Is my voice clear? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, let's thank God for his grace and bounty so we can get it together in this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, my paper topic or title is Evaluation of student ability value consistency by using smoothing technique analysis. This is based on my research. And next, why student ability matter? Ability of student is very important because most of us are lecturer, most of us are teachers and trainer. So our focus is to deliver a knowledge to our student. There are three important component in teaching and learning. First is about our plan. We have to plan what our student want to know. And then number two is conducting a teaching, teaching and learning method. And number three is about evaluation, the student have to show their ability and of course the lecturer or teacher have to assess the student ability in order to know in what competence the student is. In this paper, Student ability estimated by using IRT, item response theory, which also called modern test theory or Latin trait theory. And the question is, is the student ability more robust than zero test score? produced by uh, classical test theory or CTT. Next. Now, this is the research which including 63 vocational high school in West Sumatra province, Indonesia. The population is uh, almost 30,000 students. Consists of public school, uh, 10,000, and private school, nearly 20,000 students. And the sample, which is uh, selected by purposive sampling consists of 1,069 students from public high 
uh, school and 1000 and more from private school and then we also have anchor because this reset including what we call equating test equating needs and core test in order to process uh, the procedure for the equating test next this is the brief procedure of my research the research consists of at least uh, three big steps step one estimating in this case how to transform student x score into student ability so through estimating we can gather we can get the student ability denoted by theta the step two is smoothing smoothing is process reduce outlier or noise from data set and then refill underlying data behavior and the final is step c equating equating test mean create a common measurement scale across two or more tests so in this graph you can see at the above, we have two kinds of tests, MET A and MET B. And the score from the mathematics test, we transform it into ability of the student. And when we have the ability of student, the next process is smoothing. We smooth to distribution of the ability so that we can get four distribution, two distribution smooth, and two distribution uh, remain non smooth. And then the process of equating. Now, let's we go to the next step. We talk about the step one. Next, please. This is the process estimating ability value. Now, before we go into the next step, I want to mention that ability value is identical with the uh, test score, but test score produced by the classical test theory and otherwise uh, ability value produced by item response theory which we call modern test theory next this is now let's see the illustration i have two illustration illustration one on the left side, we can see one lady cannot live a happy barbell. Because of what? Because maybe this is a happy barbell. Barbell may be made of iron, so it is heavy, heavy. Thing. But look at the right image. This is the same lady, she can lift a light barbell easily. Because of what? Because maybe the barbell is not very heavy. Barbell is light. Maybe it's made of uh, plastic. So the question is, is she weak or strong lady? We can compare the two images, the, the image uh, on the right and the left side. 
Now, the, the, the question is, is she weak or strong lady? Okay, let's look at illustration number two. Next. This is also about the barbell. What is the difference between the image? The left image, only a child. And we can see that a child cannot lift the barbell. But on the right side, we can see that athlete can lift the barbell. Now, again, the question is, is the barbell light or heavy? This is a simple question, but to answer it, we have to consider uh, something we need to know. Next. Now, how about the student and item of the test? Barbell can, it can be the same of the item of the test. So the question is, when a student are faced in one item test, and then in another time, he also answer the another item. In one item, she can answer correctly. But in another item, she cannot answer correctly. So the question is the same as before. Is it easy item or difficult item? Now, let's look at the right part, person and student. Now, if we come back again to the the last uh, the last image, we can see that a child cannot lift the barbell, but a professional athlete can lift. Now, if the person we didn't tie, we we also the student. It did, uh, we can also give a question whether the student is under a chiffer or smart student. Because in one item, she can easily answer correctly, but in another item, she cannot answer correctly. Now, the, the question is whether the student is under a chiffer or he is a smart student. Now, this question is cannot be answered by classical test theory. This is also a problem because when we analyze a test or when we assess a student competence, we face by this uh, problem whether the student and the achiever or whether the student is a smart student. Let's to the next. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look at these two tables. This is also the explanation of the question before. Let's look at the table, the above table. The table consists of five person or five student, and five student answer five test item. So they got the score on the last column. Person number one can answer all of the item correctly. Item number one, she got. Uh, one score, item number two, one score, number three, four and five, one score. So the score is for person one is one because five divided by five uh, equal to one. 
And passage number two, got the score 0 0.8. Because item number one, uh, because he didn't pass number one, because he, the item might be uh, difficult for him. And the person three gave a score of 0 0.6. Person four gave a score 0 0.4. And the last person, person number five, is uh, get a score 1.2. And now, when we conclude, based on the table one, the above table, it looks like the person number one is a smart student. And the last, the person number five is underachiever. Now, this is can easily we see, we can conclude from the table uh, number one. And how about suddenly we have one person to come, person number six. Now, then we also have a table, the Lower table. Person four and person five the same is uh, what is in the table, uh, the above table. But person six, the new student, can answer correctly item number one and can answer correctly item number two. But the score he have is. 0 0.4. This is exactly the same what person 4 get. Now, we have the next question. Are they have equal ability? The question is, is the person number 4 and person number 5 have equal ability or equal achievement? If we look at the score, this is the same. 0 0.4 for person number four and 0 0.4 for person number six. But this is the problem because look at the person number four. Person number four only answer correctly for item four and item five. This is the easy item test. And person number six can correctly answer now item number one and item number two. And this item are hard or difficult item. And then I'm sure that they are not have equal ability. Even so, they have the same, exactly the same score, 1.4 and 1, uh, 0 0.4 and 0 0.4. Now, let's look at the next slide. Now, Many expert, many uh, lecturer and expert look at the modern test theory. And now, what is a test theory? Test theory basically aim at describing and explaining behavior X as a function of person and situation. So we have a formula, a simple formula x equal to function of p and function of s. p stand for person and s stand for situation. Now look at the table, the simple table. There are two person, person one and person two. Answer uh, three item under the three 
situation. Person one, got a right answer or can pass the item for situation one and situation two, and lose for the situation three. Meanwhile, person two only correct in situation one. Uh, so, what we can infer from this table? We can infer that person one is smarter than person two. Person one is more intelligent than person two. Therefore, this is the simple formula for a test theory, x equal to function of person and situation. This is uh, the basic theory when the item response theory can be developed. Next slide. Now we look at the classical test theory first. Classical test theory have a formula, a simple formula, x equal to t plus a. A means error. t is total true score and x is total score. This means that x didn't show the true score exactly because we have an error, an error while uh, it measure. Classical test theory assumes that all items equal contribution to the performance of the student. So, for example, if one student got the right answer uh, eight from the 10 uh, test item, so, she or he have the eight score. It doesn't matter which item he or she can answer correctly. Whether it's item one, item two, item three, this is equal contribution to the performance of the student. But item response theory assumes that probability of success on item, probability success of student, to correctly answer the item due to student ability and also due to item difficulty, item discrimination, and item guessing. This is for three parameter model in uh, item response theory. So next, how item response theory matching item and student characteristic. The uh, our IRT establish a link. The modern test theory establish a link or manage a link which linking between properties of item and individual responding to this item and underlying trait. So three component. Item properties, item properties like item difficulty, item discrimination, item guessing, and item intention for the four parameter IRT, and individual responding to this item. Individual responding basically uh, is uh, ability of a student, and the underlying trait. Underlying trait means the variable which is uh, which we measure in a single continuum. So look at the the image, the graph on the left. We can see that high high achiever means the smart student can answer correctly difficult item, and low achiever. Above, uh, on the lower, can answer correctly the easy item. And then we have a straight line 
a vertical line which is a single continuum. So IRT can establish a link or uh, matching between item and student characteristic in one single continuum. So uh, we can also see uh, the image of the scale. Before, the question is, is the particle right or weight? If we ask the question to the child, he or she answer that the barbell is weight because he, he is not so strong. But the athlete can lift the barbell easily because he is strong. So the question is the barbell leg or weight? To answer this question, use scale to measure it. This is the universal agreement. If we if we measure weight, we use a scale. And then, for example, if we measure length, we use meter. We don't use scale. Scale used to measure weight of the thing. So. Back again, IRT is placed link between properties of item, individual responding to this item, and underlying type in a single continuum. Next slide. This is the table compare what CTT and RT uh, different. CTT stands for classical test theory and RT stands for uh, item response theory or modern test theory. There are many differences, but the important uh, the important item is maybe number four item properties depend on a representative sample. It means that maybe one item is very difficult for situation one, and item may be very easy for the uh, another situation. But in RT, item response theory, item properties don't depend on representative of sample. So it doesn't matter what the sample is. Is it sample consists of smart student? Never mind. It consists of not very smart student, never mind. But the one item still depend, don't still independent, still independent of the uh, sample characteristic. Next, this is a, a conclusion that in classical test theory, the test score of the same examinee may vary from test to test, depending upon the test difficulty. For example, one student is given by two tests, in the easy test, he got a high score. And on other hand, in difficult test item or difficult test, he got a lower score. Maybe high score in test A, but low score in test B, because test B is very difficult, test A is uh, very easy. But in item response theory, item parameter calibration is sample free. Sample free means it doesn't matter the sample is very smart, sample is not very smart, doesn't matter. While examining proficiency estimation is item independent. It main purpose focus on establishing 
the individual position in that continuum. Next. This is the graph show the item parameter. In modern test theory, one parameter can be represented by one curve line. So in this graph, we can see three curve line, name item one, item two, and item three. We can compare the discrimination of three items, the difficulties of three items, and guessing factor of the item. Guessing factor means that student can, co can correctly answer the item test without thinking. Just uh, answer, uh, just answer, for example, item with uh, multiple choice item with four answer. If we got a hundred item, the student choose only answer number E. All of the time, a hundred item, she answer uh, A, option A, item one, option A, answer uh, uh, item C, he also uh, answer E, and all of them, all of the them, she answer E, so then he can got at least 25% correct. So in item response theory, the guessing factor is take into account. In this graph, we can see uh, also the, the node uh, on the right side of the graph. Item one, get a score 2.5 of A minus one B and one point uh, 25C. Now it means that uh, the discrimination of item one is 2.5. We can compare with item number two or number three. Item number one have a score A of 2.5, while number item number two, 1.5. And number three, 0 0.6. It means that item number one has a discrimination uh, function more highly, higher than the item two and the item three. So the item one is a good item, uh, especially for uh, discrimination function. And also we can see the difficulty of item one, item two, item three. The left item one is the easy item. Item one is the easy item and the item three is the most difficult item because uh, it lie on the right side. On the left side, uh, is the uh, easy item. This is the item parameter, which is take into account when we estimate the ability of a student. Next step. Next, please. Item parameter model. The next slide. Ara, please uh, move. Uh, thank you. Item parameter model. ART used for ability assessment in education to calibrate and evaluate item in a test. Questionnaire and other instrument 
and to score subject abilities, attitude, or other Latin trait. So IRT used for uh, two purpose. One to evaluate item, and another one is to score the subject abilities. And today, item response function have one more parameter. So we can see in the graph on the right side, there are one more parameter. Before we said, we mentioned about three parameters, difficulty, discrimination, and guessing. And one more is an inattention. So inattention means that when student uh, didn't face uh, answer the system in full attention, so the score may be lower. But the student is uh, seriously uh, face or uh, answer the item test, then the score may be higher than before. Next. Next is estimating ability value. So this is our objective. In this research, the first step is estimating ability value by using uh, item response theory. So when we have, when we conducting one parameter logic model, so in here we can see the formula P and two parameter logistic model. The formula uh, include uh, not only difficulty factor, but also discrimination auto. There are two parameters. And when we have three parameter logistic model, all the three uh, characteristics of the item include in that formula. Look at the, the last formula for three parameter logistic model. There are, uh, we can see there are uh, B, difficulty of item, and also alpha, discrimination, and also guessing. So we call the three parameter logistic model. Then this model, whether one parameter or two parameter or three parameter, we can estimate ability value. So in this uh, research, the ability value is calculated by using uh, three parameter logistic model. Next. So now, we begin step number two, that is smoothing process. Next. Look at this image. On the left hand, on the left hand, we have two image rod. This is not a damaged rod, yes. Damaged rod, there are hole and water, wet rod, and there are also uh, the above uh, and the below. Uh, not a good road, not good surface. There are gravel, stone, rocky road. And look at this, the right. The right is smooth surface. So road surface can be smooth by using this machine. Whether it is a drum machine, drum roller, pneumatic roller, and asphalt finisher, the heavy machine used to smooth the surface of the road. So what about the data smoothing? Data smoothing is done by using algorithm to remove noise, noise or outlier in the data set. This uh, process, the smoothing process, allow real or important pattern of the data to more clearly stand out. So we can get the important pattern of the data 
by using uh, smoothing technique. Next. Now, is this slide we can see what we call noise or outlier. There is uh, uh, many person, one stand next to the other, but we can see one, two, three, four person outside the group, and we call it outlier. And if we implemented this graph into the data, we can see on the right side, the point of data, this is a, a data plot. We can see more point near the uh, straight line. And one of them is far from the group. So this point is identified as outlier data. So if we can remove or eliminate the outlier, we can see the pattern of real data. So the outlier may be uh, analyzed separately, especially for uh, qualitative uh, research. Uh, outlier data can be analyzed uh, separately uh, for special purposes. Next, smoothing technique. When data collected display random variation, smoothing technique used to reduce the effect of this variation to reveal underlying trend. So what we uh, intend to get is uh, the real underlying trend. So we have to uh, use smoothing technique. Smoothing technique also create an approximating function that attempt to capture important pattern in the data while leaving out the noise or outlier. The data point are modified by using a smoothing uh, formula so individual data, individual data point higher than the adjacent, presumably because of the noise, are reduced. The higher data and we reduce, and the lower data point are increased. This is the basic concept of smoothing technique. Smoothing techniques uh, have uh, several kinds. The simple one is exponential uh, smoothing technique and also moving average is a, is a simple smoothing technique. At fun smoothing technique is a double exponential uh, smoothing and also hot winter smoothing technique. Next. In this reset, we use double exponential smoothing technique with this formula. Mt equal to alpha xt plus one minus alpha uh, multiplied by mt minus one plus tt minus one, where tt is we can see in that formula. Xt means initial score, so xt is score before uh, we conducting a smoothing technique. Mt is smooth score, so our objective is to get a smooth score. We conduct expon exponential smoothing technique in order to get a smooth score. So before I mentioned that we have two kinds of distribution, distribution of test score or ability score of test met A, and one other is distribution score and ability from uh, mathematic test B. Next. Now we come to the final step, step, step three, which is uh, named equating 
test. A quitting test is a st statistical procedure used to create common measurement scale across two or more form a test. So from uh, two or more uh, form of a test, we can create a common measurement scale. So they can be used interchangeably, interchangeably across different tests. It means that if student uh, take a test one or a test A, then he can get score based on the test B, the another test. So it means uh, by interchangeably across different tests. Next, test calculating model. Test calculating model can be divided into two kinds, common population and common item test. So from the two uh, tests, we can get a common population and we also can conduct an, uh, another, another technique which call anchor test. Anchor test mean item test which are on uh, include in test e, B in test A and Z items also in the test B. So two kind of test have the same item, several item. Maybe if we have a hundred uh, item test. Uh, five or ten of the item uh, also in test A and also in test B. This is, so this is, we call the anchor test, anchor test item. Next. In this research, we use the person anchor. It means that the student of uh, public vocational high school get two tests. They also have uh, test A, they also, they also answer test B. So uh, the, the student who take both tests, we call the anchor student. So. The anchor student is very important in equating test because without anchor student or anchor test, we cannot uh, conducting the equating uh, process. Next. This is uh, equating design where item in the form B also use uh, some item in uh, test B also used in uh, test A. So the two items have a common item. This is uh, a kind of item anchor equating model. And then next, now this is the example of equipercentile equating. Now we can see in test B, on the left side, one person get three. Three is uh, in standard deviation. But in test A, in the right side, he only get 1.8 in test A. So this is mean that uh, test A is more difficult than test B. Because one person with the same ability get three in uh, test B, but only get 1.8 in test A. This is a different score. Different score is this because of the test B is more easier, easier than the test, uh, then the test R. This is the sample of 
uh, equating score in uh, test. Next. Excuse me, Pa Rami. I think we only have uh, five more minutes. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, I will uh, stop. So then the, the presentation. Now, uh, come back to recent brief procedure. One step, uh, step one is intimating. We have ability of student, and then we have a smooth, after the smoothing technique, after the conducting the smoothing technique, we have four distribution in this grip. Uh, named AD, AD, BT, and BD. The two uh, distribution are smooth, and the two other non smooth uh, ability distribution. And then we equate the four distribution. When we equate the two unsmooth distribution, we get key TD, or key number one. Key stand for equating coefficient. Then, if we equate two distribution, one side distri one side is smooth, one side is non smooth, we have key one d. Only one side, uh, one distribution is smooth. And when we uh, equate the two distribution, where the two distribution are smooth then we have a equating coefficient of key 2D. Next. Now, this is a question. Unfortunately, no analytical technique to compare directly the smooth and unsmooth ability value distribution. So, the stability of equating coefficient was used as criteria. So, in this uh, reset, we only compare the stability of equating coefficient key instead of compare uh, smooth and unsmooth ability distribution because uh, there is no analytical, analytical technique to compare directly. So we can uh, indirectly uh, test this consistency of the ability by uh, by comparing equating coefficient stability. Next. Now this is the recent result. This is a sample and normality test. This is a requirement for the next uh, the requirement for the next analysis. Next. Uh, recent result. Uh, we can see in this graph. Uh, key one uh, is co equating coefficient when we equate both sides of non smooth distribution. Key two, one side smooth, and key three, both sides are smooth. The average of uh, equating coefficient, we can see key one is 919, key two, 917, and key three, 946. This is the average and the standard deviation of the uh, equating coefficient is, uh, we can see in the graph, key 3, 4, 7, 9, key 1, uh, 8, oh, 5, and key, uh, key, key 2, uh, 8, oh, 5, and key 1 is uh, 8, uh, 6, 6. Next, this is the recent result. The hypothesis compares the stability based on variant of equating coefficient. We compare K1, K2, and K3. And the data show that uh, after we analyze the data, this is uh, so that F count, we come from the data, didn't exceed F table. What does it mean? So three hypotheses proposed were rejected. On as a word, we can say the no hypothesis was accepted. That this means that no difference in stability of Q1, Q2, and Q3. Next, a discussion. 
uh, discussion before this slide. Come back again, one slide. Ah, yes. As all the hypothesis was not supported by the empirical data, the general conclusion can be drawn as the three is no difference in the stability of the equating coefficient between whether smooth or non-smooth or one side smooth or both are smooth or unsmooth, there is no stability difference in the equating coefficient. So the conclusion is equating coefficient is not, next slide. The conclusion is equating coefficient is not influenced by the application of smoothing technique. The smoothing technique didn't uh, work effectively. Both smooth and non-smooth ability value will produce the same stability of, uh, of equating coefficient. They are, they are mean the uh, ability distribution, no longer sensitive to application of smoothing technique. Smoothing technique, can change ability value distribution. So the solution technique cannot work effectively for the ability distribution. The estimation procedure in item response theory that produce ability value can actually be understood as an effort to refine the data behavior as well. So item response, item response theory through the estimation uh, formula can be seen as a smoothing technique as well. Finally, it can also be concluded that the student ability value are smooth, stable, and accurate. So ability value is recommended to be used optimally in the testing system. Thank you. And uh, I offer to the uh, moderator. Thank you, Budeni. Thank you so much, uh, Fahmi, for the uh, presentation. But unfortunately, we only have uh, maybe one or two minutes for the uh, question and answer session. So I will uh, read one question. Uh, the first question that uh, put by uh, the uh, participant, it's from, uh, I think it's Ms. Berta Farindo Murnir. And the question is, um, what is the impact of your study uh, has on society and science? Can this uh, study be used? Can the, the result of this study be used as self, uh, like a self-development resources? Uh, because uh, we know that millennials and yourself have book like uh, how to, what to do when you're sad, what to do when you're uh, writing uh, your thesis or something like that. Uh, so. That's the question, uh, Pak Fami. Can we use this uh, result of uh, the research as, uh, you know, like some uh, self-help resources? Okay. Uh, okay, this is a very good question. But uh, can you help me with any, uh, can we make it short, the question? Uh, uh, the question is, can we use this uh, result as uh, uh, self help resources at oh saya ini orangnya ternyata seperti ini berarti saya harusnya seperti yang di penelitian tersebut something like that or okay can we can we use it as, as self assessment to help us uh, to uh, something you know some problem yes yeah. mm -hmm. okay uh... My, my answer is, uh, there are two kinds of uh, test theory, classical test theory and modern test theory, named item response theory. In classical test theory, this is uh, still uh, a good theory and uh, almost of us uh, use this theory to, to assess our students. But this is uh, the weakness is the theory. I have mentioned before that if one student 
uh, take an easy exam, he looks like a smart student because not of his ability, but also because the item is very easy to, 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 to answer. So he got the, the high, high score. Mm. And then if that student, the same student, uh, face or, uh, or take a difficult item, uh, to, if difficult test, then the score of his, the student is lower than before. Because not only the ability of the student is a change, the ability is still the same, but the score is lower than before because of the all of the item is a test is very very difficult. Mm -hmm. So this is the the weaknesses of the classical test theory, and modern test theory, iterative test theory can answer that. Like uh, if we uh, ask uh, one thing. Uh, for example, uh, uh, this thing, is it light or, or weight? Uh, just like uh, a child and an uh, uh, athlete uh, before, we have to come to standard uh, instrument. What is it? Standard instrument is a scale. When we uh, measure weight of a thing, no other alternative, only we use scale. So we can uh, universally agree when we use the weight, we use the scale. So uh, I suggest that in the future, we start or we begin use the item response theory model in order to construct the test, construct the exam, and also we can use uh, this approach, uh, this theory to assess the student ability or student uh, competence. This is my answer. Uh, I hope this. Uh, will answer the question. I give over to Denny. Thank you. Thank you, Pa. So we still have a several questions, but uh, due to the tight schedule, uh, I think we have to end our session uh, right now. And uh, that's it. The third uh, session of keynote speaker. And uh, I would like to say thank you uh, to Pa Fahmi for joining us for uh, giving us something to think about <laughs> and uh, for answering the question from the audience for the audience that uh, uh, wants to ask question, more question to Pak Fahmi can uh, contact him uh, at campus or uh, at uh, uh, his email address. Uh, thank you, Pak Fahmi. Thank uh, you. Our speaker. Uh, thank you for the audience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Pat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is our keynote speaker session for today. Uh, and after this, we will have invited speaker session that will be led by uh, Dr. Rizky and Mawolan Sari. And I hope we will gain, uh, we all gain something useful today, uh, at least better understanding about uh, each topic presented by our speaker or maybe new idea for our uh, research. Thank you so much everyone for your attention, for your question. And I hope you all have a good session, good conference today. Thank you very much. And over to you, Ms. Rizky Emawulan Sari. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, Ms. Risma, for the opportunity. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, 
Let us praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessing and mercy that we can together attend this conference in healthy condition. Secondly, let's send pray to our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who had brought us to the path of life. Before going to invite the speakers, let me introduce myself first. My name is Rizki Emawalansari and I will lead the invited speaker season today. In this session, we have two invited speakers and the first one will be Ibu Dr. Insinyur Kinanti Wijaya MSG. Hello Ibu Dr. Kinanti. Yeah, hello. Hello Ibu, how are you today? I'm good. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's a pleasure that you can be our invited speaker today, Ibu. So before that, uh, let me introduce you to our participant. Ibu Dr. Kinanti is a lecturer in Universitas Negeri Medan, and she has a research experience in vocational education and focusing on civil engineering. Okay, Ibu Kinanti, you have 30 minutes to present, including question and answer. And uh, please welcome Ibu Dr. Insinyur Kinanti Wijaya MSc. The time is yours, please. Okay, thank you, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, praise and gratitude for presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has given health to all of us so that we can take part in the ninth International Conference on Technical and Vocational Education and Training, ICTVET, Universitas Negeri Padang, Padang, Indonesia. Salawat and greetings we pray to the great Prophet Muhammad SAW, which we hope to intercede in Yawmi Akhir later. And I would like to greeting um, the Honorable uh, Rector of Universitas Negeri Padang on this occasion represented by the first Vice Rector, Dr. Rifnaldi Emlet, and the Honorable Dean of Faculty of Engineering Universitas Negeri Padang, as well as speakers for today just now, Dr. Fahmi Rizal, MPD-MT, the Honorable First Dean of Faculty of Engineering Universitas Negeri Padang, Dr. Waskito, the Honorable Postgraduate Coordinator of uh, Technology and Vocational Education, Faculty of Engineering Universitas Negeri Padang, as well as Chairman of this activity, Professor Dr. Ambia Repede, and all the distinguished speaker and lecturers of Technology and Vocational Education Faculty of Engineering Universitas Negeri Padang who attended this event and all the participants and presenters who attended this event. It is an ahana for me to be able to attend this seminar as an invited speaker. Thank you all uh, the event committee. Okay, without further ado, I will start my presentation. Uh, can you see my presentation, Ms. Yes, yes I will. Okay, thank you. Well, in this opportunity, I would like to discuss and show how the world's efforts in anticipating uh, climate change and protecting the earth from an engineer's uh, point of view. One of them is making um, optimal use of building materials to meet the needs of building constructions in a green era. Well, uh, we know that the interesting issue that led to the occurrence of the eco green era was one of which started with word awareness of the global emissions that occurred. According to the Global Carbon Project Research Group, the emissions uh, decreases more than 5% in 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the world economy. Then in 2021, the world projected to emit 63.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide. It is close to the 2019 levels. 
was uh, what was uh, it like in 2019? Uh, you can see in the diagram, it uh, presented of global emission by sector according to the radium group. We can see that the biggest carbon dioxide contributor comes from the industrial sector. Now, uh, we can see now there is 5% uh, in the steel production industry, 5% in the oil and gas production industry, and 4% in the cement uh, production industry, and so on. Well, this industry uh, is what we know as a producer of uh, building, mass building materials. And another aspect is electricity. The, um, this aspect is also the second largest aspect that contributes to the emission of carbon dioxide, namely 26%. Furthermore, uh, we can see that the other aspect is from agriculture, land use, and landfills, which is as much as 21%. Next is the transport aspect, 16%, and last is the building aspect by 7%. Well, uh, all of this, uh, I, I mean, uh, the emission uh, is related and closely related to the population growth building construction activity will continue to run. This will have an impact on the depletion of natural resources to produce building materials. Maybe mm, Indonesia seems that it is still rich in natural resources, but if it is being used continuously, it will be depleted, I think. As we can see the following graph uh, of world population growth, uh, it is projected that the world population growth will continue to increase, but uh, the annual growth will decline. However, the building construction for the needs of the Earth, uh, for of the Earth's um, inhabitants cannot be stopped. Now, as we return, go back to the story, to the history about uh, building evolution, uh, building construction evolution in the world. Um, life begins with uh, good relations, the relationship between humans and nature. Then enter the stone age constructions where building construction is made of stone or comes from nature. Then after that, enter the Iron Age construction where buildings are made of steel. And furthermore, the building leads, leads to a classical style where the building is made by combining stone and steel. And then there was the production of artificial stone so that buildings were made from artificial stone with lime mortar adhesive. Then the industrial revolution starts. In the industrial revolution, steel was mass produced and used in I-beams and reinforced concrete, also um, glass pans. Uh, and then in the second industrial revolution, were introduced prefabrication and com computer added design. And there were elevators and cranes to make high rise buildings and sky um, After a human runs rampant we, uh, by prioritizing uh, comfort and modern life, impacting the health of uh, Earth, building construction is now leading to the eco green concept, namely being friendly against to uh, nature. Back to the uh, basic. Now, uh, what is eco-green construction means? 
It is means that the building construction is built in an eco-friendly manner. As uh, Professor uh, Safar Rasul said just, uh, just now that uh, he said like a smart city or a smart building, but it is uh, more uh, to the eco-friendly. The building category is said to be environmental friendly if the construction of the building makes it an appropriate site development. And the benchmark are the presence of a basic green area of more than 10 persons, community accessibility, providing public transport roads, bicycle path and pedestrians, or we can call it pedestrian friendly uh, walking path. And also affability of trees, greening and handling of good water circulation and so on. And other categories of building, uh, uh, eco-friendly construction building is if apply energy efficiency and conservation, such as using solar panels, maybe using natural lightings, good air circulation design, so reduce the air condition operation, and uh, several efforts have been described uh, also by Professor Safar Rasul. Next uh, is a healthy environment such as providing thermal light and sound comfort. Then uh, implement water conservation, such as um, installing an auto stop facet or other water saving features and also designing irrigated uh, landscapes that can be used uh, repeatedly. And furthermore, um, green building materials, eco-green, uh, eco-friendly construction involves uh, the use of research, efficient, and environmental responsible materials and process throughout the building's life cycle. Building uh, materials are durable. It must durable, energy efficient, recyclable, uh, thereby reducing waste and pollution. That uh, means for the green building materials. And also using building environment management. And I, uh, I think this building environment management should be put in the uh, learning process. So you can see, uh, I provide several pictures of buildings that implement eco-friendly construction, such as the IKN Indonesia, Ibu Kota Negara, and then Jakarta International Stadium, Indonesia also, and the most mind-blowing construction, which is currently underway in Saudi Arabia, which is called the Line Project. I just uh, showed the three examples, but many others uh, examples. Now, uh, the ICANN or Ibu Kota Negara um, is projected to become a sustainable city in the world a symbol of national identity and um, economic driver in Indonesia. On this occasion, I discussed only three principles of ICANN building construction that are related to eco-friendly construction. One is uh, design according to natural condition. The, there will be more than 75% green area in the government area of ICANN. They say uh, the access to an open space that can be shortly be reached in just two, five minutes or two minutes, I think. And then 100%, 100% eco-friendly high-rise buildings construction for any institutional and commercial and residential. And the other principle is low carbon emissions. Uh, low carbon emissions insta uh, by installation of renewable energy capacity will meet 100% of ICANN's energy needs. Uh, 
So uh, maybe we can imagine that in the ICANN we'll use a new renewable energy and will uh, uh, all the facility will uh, process yeah will uh, process with the renewable energy such as maybe the uh, suns uh, apa? suns yeah uh, the energy from the suns maybe and 60 percent increase in energy efficiency in new public buildings in 2045 and net zero emissions in ICANN in 2045 also um, and then uh, the, the other principles is uh, ICANN will circular and tough 10% of the land area of the ICANN government area is available for food production needs. So it will focus on the agriculture also and for the food productions. 60% recycle all waste generated by 2045 and 100% of wastewater will be treated through a treatment system by 2035. And uh, we we will uh, cannot hold how it will be built in the uh, Kalimantan, I think. And next, uh, project line. The line, the future of urban living. They said it will uh, accommodate 9 million people in 34 square kilometers. The line, uh, about, uh, the line using um, use a concept or principle that puts humans first without de neglecting the preservation of the natural surrounding and focus on people's health and well-being by preserve 95% uh, of nature and five minute walks also, yeah, five minute walks access to the facility in addition to high speed rail with an end to end transit of 20 minutes. and. And so they use a high technology to um, make the uh, access to the facility. It will run on 100% renewable energy. And the line also uh, make an open space suspended on multiple levels, avoiding urban sprawl. And then the city will eliminate uh, carbon intensive infrastructure like cars and roads, and automated service and amenities, uh, amenities in close proximity. And environment is designed to allow for an optimal balance of sunlight, shade, and natural ventilations. And the green open space is meant to further enhance and comfort for those living, working, and visiting. And uh, I see the line is um, known about the growth of uh, populating growth that we cannot stop the populating. So uh, how to balance the earth and the life by uh, make it in uh, the three, uh, 34 square kilometers uh, living. Uh, so it makes the future of urban living, uh, I think, in the next um, history. So what is the uh, Indonesian government uh, specially uh, given efforts? Uh, Indonesian all, all already uh, have a regulation um, related to the eco-green eco -green, uh, building, construction, and so on. There are uh, regulation about building, green open space arrangement concerning environmental protection and management, and also concerning the prevention and eradication of forest destruction, uh, Paris Agreement, implementation, and building engineering standards and green building. Uh, so Indonesia already uh, make a regulation to to maintain the natural sources yeah uh, so we we still have a chance to fill the uh, 
uh, good air and so on. I think uh, we should pursue with the uh, innovations through of uh, Saudi Arabia at the project line and introduce them uh, on campus where the government has given its efforts to through regulations related to eco green. And how is uh, efforts in education? This is uh, uh, some of uh, 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 some of things that what we should do in education aspect. Uh, one, maybe we could include the word climate issues in the learning, so that the students know about uh, how what is have to aware and then introduce and learn about the regulation related to the green building. Uh, so uh, the students uh, not, uh, no, uh, still uh, can run to, with the uh, technology and understanding for the uh, newest technology and introduce the facts of the word environment, the fact like uh, the climate issues and the emissions and uh, maybe waste, uh, handling waste in the world, uh, like uh, such as plastics and uh, uh, maybe agriculture waste and, and other so on. And so we must introduce and elaborate what is the fact of the word environment and encourage them to be aware of nature conservation and give students freedom to explore the next effort to create the concept of eco-friendly construction building. And last, I think uh, we should force and guide the student in creating an innovation through project assignment. And all of this, uh, we, we already, uh, I think we, we, we put in the learning process and what we call it maybe using the project uh, learning and project learning maybe and then uh, factory uh, learning yeah, industry and then many so on the model uh, learning that I have uh, that can be used to uh, give these efforts. Uh, Maybe I just need uh, several minutes to discuss and, and give the presentations. Miss um, Rizky, uh, that's all my presentations, and uh, I give it to you. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Ibu Dr. Kinandi, for the presentation. It is an amazing presentation about eco green, like Professor Satar before he presented about greening too. I think it is a way for us as a, a researcher to save our earth. So, uh, Ibu Kinanti, we have a question for you from Akrimula Mobile dari Universitas Negeri Padang. So the question is how do we migrate from those that are not eco green to eco green within our limitation, such as there are not enough public transportation, no electric vehicles and others. And how should we as a community together support and build this eco green culture? Okay, please. Okay, thank you for the question, uh, Akrimula Mubai. Um, uh, in my opinion, what we can start is from our living, home living first. Uh, first, we we can start with the um, uh, uh, our daily activity by uh, separate uh, the ways, yeah, separate the ways between organic and non-organic, so on, and and then for the. Uh, public transportation maybe uh, we could uh, use bicycle but but maybe uh, as uh, uh, that's why we need uh, efforts in academic also to to give the government uh, support or uh, to to build the bicycles way uh, pedestrians also and uh, focus to the 
uh, eco green uh, construction. Maybe it's hard to us to get into this, but I think we should start uh, around surrounded our living uh, day living just now. I think that's all, Miss Fiske. Okay, Doctor Kennedy. Uh, I think it's we have start from ourselves first. I think. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for another participant who have a question for Dr. Kinanti Wijaya. Due to the tight schedule, maybe uh, another participant can contact uh, Ibu Kinanti personally. Maybe you can leave your contact, uh, maybe like uh, email your email for us, and the participant can contact you personally about your research. And others. Thank you, Ibu uh, Dr. Kinanti Wijaya. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for the part of presentation and give an applause for Ibu Kinanti. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to the next invited speaker. We have Bapak Dr. Reno Rinaldi MKS. Halo Bapak. Halo, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. How are you today, Bapak? Good okay. Uh, let me introduce you first to our participant today. Uh, Bapak Dr. Reno, Reno is a lecturer in Universitas Hang Tuah Pekanbaru and he has research experiences also in vocational education and focusing on public health. Okay, Bapak, Dr. Reno, you have uh, 30 minutes, including question and answer. Are you ready, Bapak? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, uh, Bapak, Dr. Reno Renaldi, the time is yours, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sari. Okay, let's clear. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon to our participant international conference. Today there is a panel discussion in the, in the international conference. I believe that uh, from the previous speaker. We already got a lot uh, of the new knowledge uh, in this equation. I will discuss about our topic softly and brief because already in the end of present session. Today, I will discuss about the concept of how higher education, IPC, and IPA from work on COVID 19 situation. Uh, as we know, uh, higher education is very important as learning system to transfer the knowledge to our students. Today, as the lecture, we saw a keep <clears throat> we saw a keep learning innovation to our student in the COVID nineteen situation. From the previous information, the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, kept big impact to only for us but also uh, to world uh, to world to world. This my opinion, uh, all the participants in the forum uh, has their own method of learning at the university. Of course, as the lecture, we also have a new style method so that our students can learn with their lecture in the learning system. Okay, uh, this is my slide. When we enter material on the first slide, First learning concept of higher education, the curriculum and educate. Sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, the first concept of higher education. Education, education in learning process, the research, then the last, uh, not less is community service. Education is general. I come to prefer participants to become, become a community member that has ability as professional expert in implementing the 
developing and disseminating technology. Uh, so to improve level life society, we can support what is in the first studies. Now we often hear about vocational research. What is the difference between, uh, between higher education and vocational higher education? I will discuss briefly the difference between vocational higher education and undergraduate higher education from the educated educational uh, curriculum used for study. Where student, where student uh, will be faced in the using the academic curriculum for vocational education is 16% uh, practice and 14% uh, uh, theory. The uh, will for integrated education is the 16% theory and 14% uh, practice. So that this difference. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> As we know, for less uh, related to education, higher in 4.0, they are divided into six states. Uh, when A, the first, uh, the exchange curriculum with use iteration unit, then so the infrastructure application curriculum, and three, repatriation higher education, online learning, and then uh, preparation lecture, and last the certificate of privilege. In curriculum change, we must have new literacy that will apply in curriculum learning. So in pandemic, we must uh, provide new lecture according to the current world situation. As the lecture, we must be able uh, to create special way of learning, uh, such as face to face learning in Indonesia with the limit, uh, limited meeting or online learning. Given the, the situation, the goal of learning should be action. Uh, I will believe uh, I will believe that the all participation all participation notice picture. Uh, this is uh, Mr. of Indonesia culture and Mr. Mr. Nabil Makarim. I will plan how to prepare human research in the health file in the era society 5.0. Uh, we are the priority major in higher education uh, in five years forward is appropriate to uh, create a future leadership because the main uh, process in coaching, learning, whether with the character student uh, at higher education. In Indonesia, it's already many platforms that have read my, uh, by the Ministry of Education with the name Deka Bajar, such as a program, internship in company, student student, project, entrepreneurs, in the further study and activity teach in the remote area. I believe participants from Indonesia is familiar with Mereka Prajar program. Okay, next slide. Police of Ministry of Education in higher education in the area of the revolutionary industry 4.0. First uh, area, reauthorization the curriculum. Reauthorization the curriculum is the such a thing as new literacy, data, technology, and communities. The thought of what practice the partnership to be required. Second activity is the curriculum for development, uh, the step and the teamwork to continue the program. We hybrid and blended learning, apply system, uh, teaching hybrid uh, blended learning for SPADA, regular SPADA University, and then SPADA Indonesia. Uh, all the system we already familiar. And three, the lifelong learning special unit apply the system uh, teaching hybrid and uh, is the recommended to the university have the special units uh, in give 
lifelong learning service. Okay. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, where is necessary development in uh, the 4.0 era of higher education? The first human literacy. Human literacy is called communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creative, and innovation thinking. Is uh, the existence of literacy make it easy for someone to community in society? It's mean that. Uh, Knowledge and good literacy skill will be the key for the nature. Uh, the second, data literacy. Basically, data literacy is ability reading, observing, and understanding data. With ability data literacy, you can uh, you can understand the interpret the data. Uh, this approach just can be trusted for yourself. For as uh, well as business value for company. Uh, three, it is uh, literacy, technology literacy. Uh, technology literacy is everything for use uh, technology and information application, and particularly and for. Context. As the word of academia and education and tailoring. Develop at this time, we want and uh, to understand from that and the development the technologies and so fast. Uh, okay, next. Uh, we can see what activities strategy to improve. SM lecture and lecture is from Latin literature. Must be able to write new information based on the situation. And then uh, internship. Yeah. Internship. Uh, here's the hard skill student. Uh, so that say we be able to competent in the workplace. In three, uh, innovative developed product service is all uh, encouraging teaching factory. Teaching factory is learning the model that bring atmosphere industry to school so that a school can uh, produce a product with the best quality. What the positive impact uh, in the teaching factory beside whatever competency learning toward a teaching factory was stimulate of student. After and the world discipline, responsibility, honesty, cooperation, leadership, and other according to the using Okay, okay. Uh, we should be we should agree to bring activity of the learning methods and suggestions that are needed to our students. Implement the school system inside curriculum uh, study program. Uh, the uh, dual system is integrated as education level system. <clears throat> dual system is a system training, specially indicate in a mama systematic with combined benefit from company. Uh, training with education. Teaching factory, uh, teaching factory adopted from dual system different that in place of learning. Well, the dual implementation system practice uh, implemented in the company or in factory and theory itself at the school one until three days per weeks. We uh, teaching what our learning practice and carry on in the workshop organization by a school and get like the real situation in uh, factory. 
when we construction of the teaching factory. Uh, teaching factory model has a uh, three component for example, product as a production, making tense, and we loading a uh, job shape, order, work, and assessment in accordance with progress, uh, work industry standard as well. Uh, ranger study, schedule that allow for optimal delivery, uh, soft skill, and hard skill to student. <coughs> As the competence uh, can implement the same factory tool, uh, the, these three components according uh, to their respective characters and competences. The next slide. Uh, on this next slide, I will be uh, discuss about the IPC benefit. And we added to mention as interprofessional collaboration. Where the IPC interprofessional collaboration is an educational uh, process that involves to make two or more types of a professional well in education. That we are asked to prefer the best advantage who are ready to collaborate between professional in uh, providing exemplary service in health sector, such as uh, nursing, sanitarians, with waves, health promoter, nutrition, and so is the service uh, that is very hard with one in the health profession. Uh, what the next aside discuss discuss the uh, about the IPC and IPN that we mentioned the person interprofessional collaboration, where in IPC interprofessional education is educational process that involves the word more uh, while in education. Uh, I will be discussing about APA. There are uh, some information about APA. Not only implementation can cost, but more importantly, instructing the culture of interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, and we building a system that support the culture of collaboration, starting from students during university and student. Um, Talks about uh, using the grid then simplistic activity between study program and the other innovative program. You see, if it can be carried on in classroom, the other on clinical community for the practice. Okay, the next slide. I will take uh, the example system the based uh, on my special plan. Because my special are uh, in health and education system. Okay, the uh, second in the screen. I will take an example. Uh, start from local health and the current situation. Uh, and the future health workplace, there is a fragmented uh, health uh, system will occur. We share the next APA, of course, something collaboration. In the uh, some part, the we got uh, certainly shape the system important. We the heart of the local context. Next, uh, there is collaboration with APC with the COVID nineteen pandemic a situation across the impress of competence. A, that is our knowledge. B, competence of scale. C, competence of attitude. And competence of ability of time. Okay, Mr. Sari. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation of all persons who participated in the international conference. So, since then, please accept them for the domestic during the conference. We hope uh, they can. 
meet again in the future in the world to be there for better education in Indonesia. Thank you, Rector University, University of Sanjir Bandam, Professor Kenebri, Professor Rijal, Professor Dr. Biar, and thank you for the invitation on the conference. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke okay, Bapak Reno, thank you for the presentation about the concept of health educational higher education within the IPC IPE framework. This is amazing, yeah, for our educational uh, vocational education. So uh, now Bapak Reno, we have one question for you. It's from Bapak Muhammad Arpan from IKIP PGRI Pontianak. How prepare our vocational school to implement IPC or IPE in that school? Halo Bapak Reno. Halo Bapak Reno. Bapak Reno, do you hear me? Halo Bapak Reno. Bapak Reno, Halo. ya, do you hear me, Bapak? Yes. Yeah, we have one question for you uh, from Bapak Muhammad Arpan from IKPRG Pontiana. How prepare our vocational school to implement IPC or IPE framework? Please, Bapak Reno. Halo. Halo, Pak Reno. Ya, yeah. halo. Can you hear me clearly? Could you help me clearly? Okay, once again. Yeah, we have one question for you. Maybe you can see in the chat column. It's from Bapak Muhammad Arpan from Iki okay. Pontiana. Okay, for the people or professional school. Yes. The ABC and AP from work is like. Yeah. Please. With, uh, Bapak Muhammad Arpan. Yeah. Karena ini presentasi jelas presentasi saya akan menjawab dalam bahasa Indonesia baik uh, bagaimana sekolah kejuruan kita siap cipta kalian pelajar itu menggunakan bahasa Indonesia oke okay. konsepnya di sini adalah bapak Muhammad Arifan ya melakukan suatu uh, uh, penggabungan antara IPC dan IPE dalam satu uh, kejuruan yang sama Artinya, jika ini uh, ada perbedaan uh, antara kejuruan, ini tidak akan bisa. Contohnya tadi saya melakukan di bidang kesehatan. Jadi di bidang kesehatan itu ada namanya perawat, ada namanya bidan, ya. kemudian ada uh, rekam medik, itu bisa kita lakukan uh, profesional. Jadi uh, sehingga nanti akan terbentuk suatu yang namanya interprofesional uh, uh, Halo Bapak Reno. Halo, sorry. Sorry. Yes. I think you you your connection is unstable.
Silakan dilanjutkan, Bapak. Halo, Bapak Reno. Bapak Rino, halo. Ya, silakan dilanjutkan, Bapak. Oke, tadi koneksi ya? Iya, tadi terputus sepertinya. Oke, eh, Bapak Muhammad Arfan. Oke. Tadi perasaan saya sudah selesai untuk menjawab ternyata koneksi koneksi ya baik uh, sifat ABC dan IPA ini bisa dilakukan apabila dalam satu bidang yang sama Pak. Tadi saya sudah menjelaskan dalam bidang kesehatan uh, di bidang kesehatan itu ada namanya kepelawatan kemudian juga ada namanya uh, kebidanan. Nah, ini bisa dijadikan satu kolaborasi, Pak. Kolaborasi hingga terbentuk suatu sistem yang namanya IPC dan IPA. Nah, jika kalau kita dalam sekolah kejuruan, mungkin kita bisa lihat dulu Pak, ke bidang ilmunya apa? Gitu. Bidang ilmunya apa? Kalau masih dalam bidang ilmu yang bisa dilakukan kolaborasi, itu bisa terbentuk suatu yang namanya IPC dan IPA. Mungkin begitu, Bu Sari, sifatnya. Yeah, so I think that uh, IPC and IPE framework we can implement it to related uh, major maybe yeah, but I know. And I think we also can Im implement the IPC and IPE framework to engineering, but we have to um, identify what is the concentration or what is the course that we want to use to implement the IPC and IP framework. Is it true, Bapak Reno? Seperti itu ya, kira-kira? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Bapak Dr. Reno Renaldi MKS. And let's give an applause for Bapak Dr. Reno Renaldi. Thank you so much, Bapak. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, dear participant, ladies and gentlemen, we will now have lunch break for about one and a half hours. So you can choose whether to stay in this Zoom room during the break or to leave. If you leave the room, please join us again at 2 p.m. We entering Zoom room at the same link. Jadi Bapak Ibu, serta seminar, kita akan istirahat dulu untuk sholat subuh dan makan siang selama lebih kurang satu setengah jam. Jadi peserta boleh tetap bergabung di room Zoom ini. Bagi yang keluar dari room, nanti silakan bergabung kembali sekitar pukul 1.20 ya Bapak Ibu, karena kita akan melanjutkan parallel session uh, sekitar pukul 1.30. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Saya selaku moderator mengucapkan terima kasih dan mohon maaf jika terdapat kesalahan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam.
Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process. Research to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Boroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay USP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international student here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Welcome to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education or DPTBE Graduate School Universitas Negeri Padang. Professor's Room is a space for all full-time professors based in DPTBE that enable them not only to work individually, but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern Classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. This events or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, as a minors and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the BTBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and advice students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is consultation room where students and lecturers interact to share their knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. Rooms. The PTBE is also supported by family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment. Computer Laboratory is a service unit under DPTVE equipped with a cluster of computers that are networked and available for use by the students and lecturers. Excellent doctoral program on technical and vocational education based on feasibility study and, go and evaluation from the Indonesian government so that is this trust to create vocational Indonesian to stand Indonesian since 2013. The curriculum has been revised and developed based on need. Our green and beautiful campus environment are ready to welcome you to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Padang.
Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri HD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adelin Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay USP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international student here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Welcome to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education or DPTBE Graduate School Universitas Negeri Padang. Professor's Room is a space for all full-time professors based in DPTBE that enable them not only to work individually but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern Classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. This is events or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, as the minors and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the DPBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and environments for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is consultation room where students and lecturers interact to share their knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. Rooms. The PTBE is also supported by family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment. Computer Laboratory is a service unit under DPTVE equipped with a cluster of computers that are networked and available for use by the students and lecturers. Excellent doctoral program on technical and vocational education based on feasibility study and, go and evaluation from the Indonesian government so that it is trust to create vocational Indonesian to stand Indonesian since 2013. The curriculum has been revised and developed based on need. Our green and beautiful campus environment are ready to welcome you to the doctoral program of Technical Professional Education, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Pada.
Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school hello everyone nama saya maria adeline buroin i'm from cabi state university philippines is worth to remember and worth to share to the world Mabuhay, USP. other facilities include a medical clinic international student dormitories the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are from Myanmar. We are studying in different faculties at UNP, and we are very proud to be an international students here at UNP. And we love UNP. In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Welcome to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education or DPTBE Graduate School Universitas Negeri Padang. Professor's Room is a space for all full-time professors based in DPTBE that enable them not only to work individually, but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. events or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, as the minors and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the BTBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and environments for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is consultation room where students and lecturers interact to share give knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. Rooms. The PTBE is also supported by family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment. Computer Laboratory is a service unit under DPTVE equipped with a cluster of computers that are networked and available for use by the students and lecturers. Excellent doctoral program on technical and vocational education based on feasibility study and, go and evaluation from the Indonesian government so that it is trust to create vocational Indonesian to stand Indonesian since 2013. The curriculum has been revised and developed based on need. Our green and beautiful campus environment are ready to welcome you to the doctoral program of Technical Professional Education, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Padang.
Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Buroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay USP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an Indonesian student here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Welcome to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education or DPTBE Graduate School Universitas Negeri Padang. Professor's Room is a space for all full-time professors based in DPTBE that enable them not only to work individually, but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern Classroom achieves a projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. events or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, examiners, and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the BTBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and environments for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is consultation room where students and lecturers interact to share their knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. Rooms. The PTBE is also supported by family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment. Computer Laboratory is a service unit under DPTBE equipped with a cluster of computers that are networked and available for use by the students and lecturers. Excellent doctoral program on technical and vocational education based on feasibility study and, go and evaluation from the Indonesian government so that it is trust to create vocational Indonesian to stand Indonesian since 2013. The curriculum has been revised and developed based on need. Our green and beautiful campus environment are ready to welcome you to the doctoral program of Technical Professional Education, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Padang.
Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri PhD, Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adeline Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. Mabuhay USP! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UNP Hotel, a mosque, a business center, and a teacher education center. We are studying in different faculties at UNP and we are very proud to be an international student here at UNP. And we love UNP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
Welcome to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education or DPTBE Graduate School Universitas Negeri Padang. Professor's Room is a space for all full-time professors based in DPTBE that enable them not only to work individually, but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern Classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. Classes events or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, as the minors and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the DPBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and environments for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is consultation room where students and lecturers interact to share their knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. Rooms. DPTBE is also supported by family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment. Computer Laboratory is a service unit under DPTBE equipped with a cluster of computers that are networked and available for use by the students and lecturers. Excellent doctoral program on technical and vocational education based on feasibility study and, go and evaluation from the Indonesian government so that it is trust to create vocational Indonesian to stand Indonesian since 2013. The curriculum has been revised and developed based on need. Our green and beautiful campus environment are ready to welcome you to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Pada.
Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UNP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganevri HD. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable programs. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructures such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama saya Maria Adelin Doroin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world.
graduate and be an international level university. UNP equips itself with laboratory supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as a desired practicum and training facility. Welcome to the doctoral program of Technical Vocational Education or DPVE, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Padang. The workers' room is a space for all full-time professors, both in DPVE, that enable them not only to work individually, but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. designs or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, examiners, and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the DPBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and environment for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is conversation room where students and lecturers interact to share their knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. The PPBE is also supported by family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment.
computer laboratory is the service unit under DPTVE equipped with a cluster of computers that are networked and available for use by the students and lecturers. Excellent doctoral program on technical and vocational education based on feasibility study and, go and evaluation from the Indonesian government. Project is to trust to create vocational Indonesian to stand Indonesian team 2015. The curriculum has been revised and developed based on need. Our green and beautiful campus environment are ready to welcome you to the doctoral program of technical vocational education in Radio School Universitas Negeri Padang. Universitas Negeri Padang established in 1954 under the name PTPG Batu Sangkar. UMP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Professor Ganesri Rizki. Director of Universitas Negeri Padang. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Padang. The impact of technology and the industry nowadays has triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang 
are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped facilities and infrastructure such as a main library with digital services, an auditorium with a capacity of more than 8,000 seats, swimming pools and sports fields of national and international standards, and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama Saya Maria Adeline Borotli. I'm from Calgary State University, Philippines. It's work to remember and work to share to the world. Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitory, BUNT hotel, a mall, a business center, and a teacher education center. In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UNT equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities. Welcome to the doctoral project of Technical Vocational Education or DTPVE, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Padang. The whole program is a space to offer some professors that in DTPVE that enable them not only to work with the vocabulary but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities enrolled in campus. Quadran Classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. designed for a seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, examiners, and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan and findings of the study. In order to keep our learning at home, 
Ubbi skipped improving its teaching and learning process when updates is creating positive learning process and environment for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is consultation room where students and lecturers interact to share good knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. The UBBE is also supporting their family and career path to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment. Computer Laboratory is the service unit under DPPBE equipped with a cluster of computer that are not used to the model as a Excellent doctoral program of chemical and vocational education based on feasibility study and by an evaluation from the Indonesian government. Project is to strive to create vocational education based on Indonesian theme 2015. The curriculum has been modified and developed based on need. Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1954 under the name PKPG 31, UNPG Research is to become a reputable internationally recognized university.
pray nowadays sa Free Church kung may pagkas ng ipadang si Bishop si Sunday Boy Program. Kung may pagkas ng ipadang focuses on education and qualified teaching process. Kung set on high quality publication, then community services that give percentages to the society. campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped auditorium with a capacity of swimming pools and sports pools are also Jenny Pearl, PUS Business Center and City order to improve the quality of its radio and be an agent of locally we and the
Universitas Negeri Padang. Establish in 1954 under the name PPPG Batikaba. UMP Vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. Technologies and the industry nowadays has triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research on high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. Campuses of Universitas Tripada are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has a good auditorium with a capacity of swimming pool and sports field. to improve the quality of its graduates and give an internship university UMP where the graduate practical and
Excellent doctoral program of Sonica and Vocational Education based on feasibility study and an operation from the Indonesian government. Project is to start to train vocational Indonesian patient Indonesian team 2013. The curriculum has been verified and deployed is on NIS.
Universitas Negeri Padang Established in 1954 Under the name BKPG Batu Saga UMP Visa is to become a reputable internationally recognized university The impact of technology on the industry nowadays has triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research on high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. Campuses of Universitas Sri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped auditorium with a capacity of 20 plus and sports pitch. Jenny Pearl, BUS Business Center and Food Order to improve the quality of its gradient and be an internet university, UMP. Well, as the district practicum in.
Veronica and Vocational Education based on feasibility study and the and operation from the Indonesian government. Project is to trust to pray vocational education to from Indonesian team 2013. The curriculum has been verified and developed based on need. Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1952 under the name PPPG 31. UMP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. The impact of technology on the industry nowadays has triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research on high quality publication, then community services that give facilities to the society. Campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has a good auditorium with a capacity of swimming pools and sports fields. Thank you. 
order to improve the quality of its gradient and be an instant multiple UMP
application based on feasibility study and the uh, operation from the Indonesian government in order to start to create vocational Indonesian team from Indonesian team 2013. The curriculum has been verified and developed based on need. Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1952 under the name PPPG Batisana, UMP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. of technology and the industry nowadays has triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, community services that give advantages to the society. Campuses of Universitas Tripada are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has equipped auditorium with a capacity of swimming pools and sports fields.
order to improve the quality of its gradient and be an instant multiple you are to
application based on feasibility study and the uh, evaluation from the Indonesian government in order to speed trust to create vocational Indonesian based on Indonesian team 2013. The curriculum has been verified and developed based on need. Universitas Negeri Padang, established in 1952 under the name PPPG Batu Saga. UMP's vision is to become a reputable internationally recognized university. of technology on the industry nowadays has triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research on high quality publication, then community services that give facilities to the society. Campuses of Universitas Sri Padang are spread across seven areas in West Sumatra. Universitas Negeri Padang has achieved auditorium with a capacity of swimming pool and sports field.
able to improve the quality of its gradients and give the impression of vertical
warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Profesor Ganesri Rizli, Director of Universitas Tinggi Padang. Welcome to Universitas Tinggi Padang. of technology and the industry nowadays have triggered Universitas Negeri Padang to develop sustainable program. Universitas Negeri Padang focuses on education and qualified teaching process, research and high quality publication, then community services that give advantages to the society. The campuses of Universitas Negeri Padang are spread and laboratory schools from kindergarten to senior high school. Hello everyone, Nama Saya Maria Adeline Borotin. I'm from Cabe State University, Philippines. It's worth to remember and worth to share to the world. USC! Other facilities include a medical clinic, international student dormitories, the UMP hotel, a mall, a business center, and a teacher education center. properties at UMP and we are very proud to be an innovation experience here at UMP. And we love UMP! In order to improve the quality of its graduates and be an international level university, UMP equips itself with laboratories supported by sophisticated equipment, a center for developing students' soft skills and creativity, as well as adequate practicum and training facilities.
welcome to the doctoral project of Technical Vocational Education or DPTVE, Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Padang. The Vulture Room is a space for all full-time professors, both in DPTVE, that enable them not only to work individually, but also to discuss and share their views on any issues related to their activities and roles in campus. Modern classroom equipped with projector, Wi-Fi, and smart board facilities to let students have great learning experience in class. Events or seminar room where students can present their proposal, research findings in front of advisory committee, examiners, and other students to get comments and evaluate the proposed research plan or findings of the study. In order to achieve our learning outcomes, the DPBE keeps improving its teaching and learning process. One of those is creating positive learning process and environment for students and lecturers. One of our main facilities is conversation room where students and lecturers interact to share their knowledge, discuss on their research issues and topics. The PPBE is also supporting their family and caring staff to ensure students are learning in a safe and supportive learning environment.
we have our closing ceremony and please wait for it. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Ladies and gentlemen, this conference will be officially closed by our Dean, Dr. Fahmi Rizal MPDMT He will also announce the best presenter The decision was taken by the chairwoman and co-chairman of each room based on several criteria To Dr. Fahmi Rizal MPDMT, the time is yours Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Before we close our international conference, once again, I want to thank to Rector 
of Nusa Studi Padang, Profesor Ganevri PhD, Vice Rector One on Academic Affairs, Dr. Refnaldi Emlit, keynote speakers, invited speakers, and all of the audience conference member, Vice Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Ustaz Negeri Padang, Head of Program Studi, Study Program, Professor Ambiar, and all of us who join this international seminar today. Today we have discussed many aspects. At least 100 of presenters have discussed their ideas and the research result in the field of technological education and professional education today. And let me announce the best presenter for a room in this afternoon. In room one, the best presenter goes to Deki Antoni Kifta. Congratulations to Mr. Deki for winning the best presenter in room one with the paper entitled Improvement of Welding Skill Using Competence-Based Education and Training Method. And in room two, the best presenter held by Ibu Yuliana. This paper entitled Education and Prevention of Internet Gaming Disorder. And in room three, Mr. Nanang Alamsa winning the best presenter. He present this paper entitled Implementation of Analytical Hierarchy Process Best Was Method in Supplier Selection. And now for room four. In room four, the best presenter held by Doni Tri Putrayanto with paper entitled Virtual Laboratory Best Job Sheet for Vocational Education Student in Higher Education. And in room five, in room five, the best presenter held by Nabila Tri Amanda with paper entitled Analysis of Percentage Not in Employment Education or Training of Yaws in Indonesia Using Panel Data Regression with Moderating Variable. And now, Room 6. Ibu Megasari Kurnia winning the best presenter in room six with paper literature review EEG the characteristic of student learning concentration due to the audio stimulus. In room seven, in room seven, the best presenters goes to Ibu Lili Suryati. Potential application of teaching factory based on technopreneur strengthening model in increasing entrepreneurial productivity in vocational education. Now, finally, in room 
A. In room A, the best presenter held by Mr. Ahsanu Fikri. With the paper, Development of Comic Learning Media Based on Character Value on Parabolic Motion Material for High School Students. Congratulations to all of the best presenter and maybe next time we will meet again in other event. And now uh, let us close this international conference on technological and vocational education and training conducting by Faculty of Engineering Usas Negeri Padang by saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin, Wassalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you so much to our dean. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a wrap. We would like to thank to all the speaker and presenter for their excellent presentation. And for your article information about revision publishing, uh, you can check it at OJS and WhatsApp group. And last, I also thank you so much to everyone for your attention, for your question, for your participation. I hope you all have a good session today and hopefully we will see you again next year. I'm Sartika Anori, Master of Ceremony. I apologize for any mistake I made today. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for all. Sebelum bubar, kita foto bersama. yang telah bersusah payah bekerja keras siang dan malam agar seminar internasional kita ini bisa berlangsung dengan baik dan Alhamdulillah ini sudah berhasil dengan baik tidak ada kendala-kendala yang berarti dan Alhamdulillah sukses untuk kita semua Nah, sekarang kita ambil posisi untuk berfoto. Nah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, for all the participants and presenter, uh, you can uh, leave this room. Thank you. Indonesia adalah harga hidup kita Tak boleh terbelah, tak akan berubah Merah putih harus berkibar selamanya Garuda terpahat dalam dada Indonesia adalah bangsa yang mulia Saling menghormati dan saling menjaga Adabnya yang luhur dan penuh toleransi Merawat perbedaan di dalam harmoni Satria Indonesia Menjaga budaya setia pada akarnya Tanggung dan berkasa Pada tanah air ini kami berjanji Tegak berdiri di atas bumi pertiwi Satria Indonesia Menjaga negara Setiap pada sejarah
tak akan berubah Merah putih harus berkibar selamanya Garuda terpaha dalam dada Indonesia adalah bangsa yang mulia Saling menghormati dan saling menjaga Setiap pada sejarah Berani bersumpah